so we can start the session. Thank you very much indeed. There were some very bemused faces when I arrived at the museum. People obviously came to see Egyptian antiquities and couldn't quite understand why there were six shiny uh, trucks parked outside. So here we are talking about the truck of the future. My name is Cathy Smith. I'm going to be your moderator, so asking questions and introducing people, keeping people in order. We want to hear from you, and I'll explain that in a moment. But the truck of the future, I'm sure that people here have all got very different views on it, but I think everybody shares the view that it should be innovative, fuel efficient, and safe. It's just how you get there, what is the best means of making it um, those things. So today we're opening a debate really, policy makers, manufacturers, road hauliers, environmentalists, anybody who's got an interest in this area, it's a chance to talk about it. The online debate has already started, I don't know if people have been following on the ASEA website, but um, we've had uh, questions each week where people have been able to tweet their responses. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a, a sense of some of the tweets. One of the questions was, how can trucks go on becoming more fuel efficient in the future? So, for instance, uh, we had from Zero E, by a constant focus on efficient loading, or by using renewable fuels. Peter Shakespeare, I love that, the idea that somebody called Shakespeare is tweeting. Um, Optimise engines and drive lines and aerodynamics, but the biggest game will be higher capacity vehicles, he says, do more with less. Uh, somebody else says innovation is key to fuel efficient trucks. Manufacturers should keep on investing in new technologies. So just a little idea of the sort of things that people have been saying. Um, so you know that the password for the Wi-Fi in here is actually hashtag truck uh, of the future in one word. Ha hashtag truck of the future. And that of course is also the Twitter address. So during the event, we're very happy to take questions via Twitter. I've got my trusty iPad here, so I will see if you're asking questions, and then I can put them to our speakers as we go through. So that's all I've got to say at the moment, because I think I should hand you over to your real hosts. And first of all, Eric Yonhart, who is the Secretary General of ASEA, and I think Eric's going to give us a view of the commercial vehicles sector today. So thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, commissioner, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you to have taken time out of your busy schedules to be with us this afternoon. Here with ASEA, you know ASEA stands for the European Automobile Industry, that means passenger cars as well as commercial vehicles, but today's event is only about commercial vehicles, trucks. It's the 10th annual commercial vehicles event already, but for me it's the first, because I'm the new arrival, just have taken over as Secretary General of ASEAN since October. The theme of today was mentioned, truck of the future. Innovative, fuel efficient, safe. And this theme has not been a coincidence. Before this through, we know society out there has high expectations from our industry. They want less emissions, they want us to be safer, they want us to make less noise, contribute to better air quality, supporting mobility in, in cities, outside cities. And I can tell you, our industry is embracing these challenges. They are embracing these challenges through their innovation efforts, because the trucks, the vans and the buses of today are really already the most technologically advanced in the globe. They are also the cleanest, they are also the safest. And if you, you know, were entering the museum, you were already able to have a glance and see some of the trucks on display, which are among the finest you can find on the market, the new Euro 6 models. And this innovation is just going on. I mean, you know that, or you may know, that fuel consumption and by consequence CO2 emissions have decreased by over a third since 1970. Trucks have become safer, I mentioned it already, now involved in just 6% of the accidents. Now, I hear you saying, yes, but we want more. 
right? More must be done. I can tell you more is being done, okay? Our industry is highly competitive, I can tell you. I arrived in the industry shortly, but can already testify it's a highly competitive industry. Where companies are competing in bringing the latest innovations to the market. Healthy competition is the trick for innovation. Healthy competition is the trigger to create the truck of the future. Now, we have lined up for you uh, a very impressive group of speakers, both from the business side as well as from the institutions. We really hope that by bringing them together, there will be a good exchange where we want to think through how we can jointly address these challenges of tomorrow. Because we can only you know, address those challenges by working more closely together, industry, European Commission, European Parliament. Now, before we start with the first keynote speech, I'd like to invite you to watch a very short video highlighting some of the facts and figures of our industry. Enjoy, and thank you for your attention. to look back at what we have achieved so far, 
Second, to talk about the direction future transportation will take. And third, to discuss what transportation industry and policymakers together have to do to get there. Looking back, the bottom line is the truck industry has done its job. That's what we feel, that's how we think about it. Trucks on European roads today are safer, cleaner and more fuel efficient than ever. Let's take a closer look at our record and start with active safety. Our, our te technological progress is really impressive. Um, you will see uh, what I mean in a movie later this day. Uh, but thanks to new braking technology um, and systems, trucks have nearly the same stopping distance as passenger cars. Given the pure physics involved, this is an amazing accomplishment. It is also a success story for joint efforts of EU, EU policymakers and our industry. Together, we have set the right priorities for the development, commercialization, and market penetration of active safety systems. This collaborative effort clearly has paid off, while transport performance in Europe has grown by 15% since the year 2000, the number of truck accidents with fatalities decreased by 60%. No doubt, with the regulatory roadmap with, for safety we've agreed on, this development will continue thanks to the ongoing implementation of electronic stability control, the introduction of lane departure warning systems along with the first phase of automated emergency braking systems in 2015 and the second phase of these braking systems that follow in the year 2018. And the requirements for new cabin strength that go into effect in 2020. With many of these safety technologies and related policies, we set a benchmark for the world. Just think about it. Japan just initiated the legislative approach a procedure for automated emergency braking system they just started. The US did not set an introductory date for this technology until recently. And China has no safety regulations at all. In the meantime, here in Europe, we are already working on the technologies beyond 2020. These include, for example, pedestrian detection and a turning assistant that will help the driver to discover blind spots when turning left or right. The trucks in Europe are not only safer, but also cleaner, and at the same time, more fuel efficient. Let me give you some numbers to back that up. Since 1990, we continuously reduced nitrogen oxide by more than 97%, in particular the emissions of European commercial vehicles by more than 99%. While Euro 6 emissions will be so minimal, they're hardly actually hard to measure. <coughs> Hence, we strongly believe that a further tightening of limits beyond uh, Euro 6 is not necessary, or better said, it's not effective to tighten those limits even further. You have, have a difficult time to measure these things. This is not only true from a technological, but also from an economic point of view. In the past, many new regulations have led to market distortions. The reason is quite obvious. Shipping companies are very, very price sensitive. Even slight increases in change, uh, slight changes in buyer, even slight increases change buyer, buying behaviors. As a consequence, both our sector and our environment do suffer. Right now, we're getting to that point yet again. Our industry is facing high demand due to pre-buy effects of the Euro 5 vehicles next year's. That's, our, that's what's happening right now. Many of, of us will probably, probably struggle with the opposite problem, at least for the first six months. Still, the industry uh, did what it was asked to. With Euro 6 emissions, we, are, uh, we reduced uh, emissions significantly yet again. And this is as well true for another bigger, even bigger arena, which is CO2. In fact, European manufacturers are world leaders in fuel efficiency. A modern long-haul track today is over 30% more fuel efficient than 30 years ago. And recent studies in Germany have shown why transport mileage nearly doubled over the last 10 years. <coughs> Total CO2 emissions of road transport uh, have made, remained constant. You can assume a similar trend for Europe. 
This is by no means the end of the story. ASEA truck manufacturers have committed to a 20% fuel reduction in the period from 2005 to the year 2020. We're making good progress towards that target, but we also know due to diminishing returns, further progress will be even more difficult to achieve. This brings me to my second point, the direction future transportation will take. It is beyond debate that the transport industry will remain a key industry for Europe. Simply put, transportation drives economic prosperity and it drives jobs. This is especially true for the commercial vehicle industry. Trucks and vans deliver goods and services we take for granted in our daily lives. In fact, they carry the lion's share, about 90% of all value of all goods in Europe. Statistically, every single day, trucks deliver about 35 million tons of consumer goods, as well as industrial goods. Trucks and vans are also among the cleanest and most efficient modes of transportation, especially here in Europe. Taking payload and average fuel consumption into account, we have the lowest CO2 emissions of all major regions. Japan has an average of 43 uh, uh, CO2 grams per ton kilometer. The US is an average of 41. China is at 36, while Europe is just 32. In addition to delivering freight, our industry also delivers jobs. A total of more than 3.6 million people in the US manufacture or sell commercial vehicles or work as suppliers, drivers or haulers. Ultimately, every industrial job in Europe depends on road transportation. Can you imagine an economy without in and outbound logistics? It would simply be impossible to manage today's value chains without point-to-point -point transportation that can be delivered just in time. I think my point is clear. Everybody wants to have free movement of goods. Everybody wants to have his steak. Everybody wants to have his furniture. You know, especially when Christmas is near. And everyone wants to have a safe job and a thriving economy. <clears throat> so, in that respect, the truck industry is not a problem, but an enabler for growth and for prosperity. But not everybody out there agrees with that conclusion. To some, rail transportation is the sole solution for future transportation. And in that respect, I respectfully, in that respect, I respectfully disagree. But don't get me wrong. I'm, I have no objections at all, at all against rail transport. To the contrary, I think it's an important transport mode to tackle our grain growing freight volumes. But rail traffic cannot shoulder it all. That's not a value statement of any kind, it's simply reality. Rail transport lacks the capacity. Every year, Europe's rail would have to increase its transport capacity by 20% only to cover the additional transport volume of land transportation in Europe. And even if we could manage to improve rail infrastructure significantly, it would still be insufficient in terms of speed. The average international freight train in Europe runs at 18, 18 one eight, uh, kilometers per hour, whereas a long-distance truck averages 75 kilometers per hour. As time is the second currency in our society, this is significant cost. Plus, recent sh studies show that on shorter distances, up to, a, for example, two kilo 200 kilometers per hour, a truck has also an advantage over trains in terms of CO2 emissions. So, substituting road freight with rail by law does not make much sense, but from an economic as well as from an environmental point of view. What does, however, make sense is to strike an optimum balance. We need to integrate all means of transportation, each with their particular strength. So let's discuss how we get there uh, together, free from ideology, free of bias, and free of prejudice. Let's evaluate every possible solution based on its efficiency and facts, not just beliefs. The same goes for CO2 reductions in the CV market. Some say there's a clear limit for passenger cars. Why not have the same for commercial vehicles? Our answer is that there are two important differences between these two markets, passenger car and commercial vehicles. First, the commercial, the commercial vehicle market, in the, first, in the commercial vehicle market, customers have always demanded the lowest possible cost of ownership. 
just one or two percentage points drop in fuel consumption provide a major incentive in the purchasing to the decisions of our carriers. In other words, contrary to the buyers of passenger cars, drug customers calculate and, and decide on based on hard facts. What they need is to be best informed for their calculations. So let's give our customers full transparency for on fuel efficiency and let them decide. They will be the best regulators for fuel efficiency. The second difference between truck and passenger cars is the high variety of commercial vehicles. Due to nearly infinite combinations of motors, axles, cabins, trailers, boxes, mixers, everything that goes on a truck. Think about it. There are a few hundred shapes and sizes of passenger cars out there, while the trucks have several thousands. They are virtually uncountable what you can see when you drive out on those streets of different trucks. So regulation through limits is suboptimal at best and virtually impossible at worst. The truck market's complexity can hardly be reflected in any legislation. Instead, we should put our focus on a more stable foundation, that is, development of a measuring method that covers the wide variety in vehicles and missions. By developing a computer simulation um, based on real-world data, the Commission has already laid a solid foundation just to do that. Basically, the system can calculate the specific emissions data for each individual truck configuration. This value will be very close to reality. Our industry fully supports the development of this method as it will improve real-life declaration of fuel consumption in trucks and industry and thus help our consumers to reduce their costs. But to get the whole picture, the declaration effort has to be focused on the complete truck, which means not only the tractor, also the trailer, on the different trailers and the different bodies, and not just the tractor, and not just the engine. Otherwise, we lose out on significant optimization potential. While it's, while it's quite difficult to get another percentage of fuel efficiency out of the tractor, it's really easy to get four to five to six, seven percentage points out of what's behind the tractor, example, the trailer. That's why we need to look at the whole picture, not a single part, and we say uh, implement this full vehicle simulation, declare the value of all substantial truck configurations, and I have complete confidence that the consumer and the market will do the rest of the work. The most successful products will be the best for the environment, the economy, and the consumers. On top of that, the Euro European truck industry and its policymakers could draw another blueprint for the world with this simulation. We can pave the way to harmonize CO2 measurements for drugs on the, on the global basis. We are at the forefront. We are far ahead of what America is doing, China is doing, uh, Latin America is doing. This could be another way to pave uh, into the future. Still, we have to face the fact I mentioned before. Additional gains in fuel efficiency will be more and more difficult to achieve. And the truck industry cannot address all of the emission-related concerns alone. That's why we need the support, the idea of an integrated approach. My third and my last point for today. To make it clear, this is not about finger-pointing or shirking responsibility. The opposite. The commercial vehicle industry will do its share to shape the future of road transportation. But political leaders, the oil industry, the haulers, the operators, and last but not least, the drivers themselves must also do their part. In other words, if we really want to move the needle, we need to move to more than just squeeze the last percentage point out of the tractor. We have to look at those parameters where we can realize major efficiency gains and the measure I'm thinking about here include improvement of transportation infrastructure. One stop per kilometer, for example, in stop and go traffic increases the fuel consumption by 50%. In other words, even the cleanest truck will not help the environment if it idles in traffic jams. Truck operators can still work on ideal setup of their truck, from keeping the right tire pressure to optimize loading. The measures can easily result in CO2 reductions of up to 5%. Driver training. An anticipatory driving style can reduce CO2 emissions and fuel consumptions by around 
In this respect, thematic systems can have also have a, a significant impact. And let's also, let's also want to put that forward, rethink weight and dimension of drug schemes. Increase the permissible gross vehicle weight of trucks by only four tons and CO2 emissions can be, truck, can be cut by 2%. Increase the permissible length of truck combinations and reduce consumption and emissions of a 40 ton vehicle without increasing weight, so 40 ton by up to 30%. This happens in Scandinavia every day. We have those trucks on the road in Scandinavia. So why are we in Scandinavia? And last but not least, clean fuels. The second generation of biodiesel would significantly improve CO2 emissions per liter diesel up to 80%. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced such an integrated approach will support both Europe's economy and also its environment. To get there, we need an open and every constructive dialogue. We, we are ready to broaden the range of thoughts. We are ready to widen the perspective. So let's approach it as we always did, with coordination, cooperation and a healthy compromise. You can account on the truck industry to be a good partner in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that is the industry point of view. Uh, we're now going to hear from the European Commission because, as you know, the Commission already has its strategy for CO2 in passenger cars and is working on a strategy now for heavy duty vehicles. So to update us on that and also to talk about her version of the truck of the future, we're very happy to have with us the Commissioner for Climate Action, Connie Havegard. And the Commissioner, we hope we might be able to take one or two questions afterwards. So please be prepared with your questions or send me the Twitter questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. Congratulations with the new assignment. We normally have a tradition of working very well together, I think. We will not always agree on everything, you will know that. But as you come from the consumer protection business, I understand, you will know why sometimes regulators and those representing the producers should not always see everything in a similar manner. But I must say, Mr. Dr. Bannon, when I hear what you said here, I think that there is a lot of common ground. And thank you very much for this very, very clear overview of what has been done and also what is being planning. Uh, you said that the truck, you started to say that the truck industry has done its job and I was a bit nervous. Uh, I thought, well, is that sort of, but you said it yourself, it's not the end of the story. Many have done their job in the climate field, that's very, very good, but I think we also, all of us know that it's a continuous process. Uh, but as you also said, uh, politicians will have to do their job as well. And I know uh, very well that you as industry stakeholders need clarity on our policies. We're also very much stressing that we have this holistic approach, integrated approach, I agree very much with that. But also this that the policies need to be predictable. This is vital given your industry's very long planning horizon, long research and innovation and investment cycles. Of course I leave the contributions on the technical solutions to, to others. And I understand that there are many, from vehicle technologies, improved aerodynamics, improved driver training, as we also saw it and just heard it, intelligent infrastructures and logistics, and not least alternative fuels, as you also mentioned in the end. I'll try to contribute to your future plans by indicating where the Commission stands when it comes to heavy duty vehicles, CO2 emissions, and in particular the prospects for future legislation. First, what is the starting point? We know that road transport contributes some 20% of the total EU emissions of CO2. While emissions from industry, from the power sector, from many areas of society are already falling, and in some sectors falling sharply, the reality is that the combined emissions from road transport have increased since 1990. We need to act further to try and curb these emissions. We have already taken action as regards cars and vans, as was just mentioned, on CO2 emissions. We have set targets of 130 grams CO2 per kilometer for cars in 2015. 
and 175 grams CO2 per kilometer for vans in 2017. The co-legislators have also recently concluded on 2020 targets for both cars and vans. As the regulation on vans is still fairly new, it dates only sort of a, a little more than two years back, it's from February 2011, it is rather early to assess its effectiveness. But as regard cars, um, we do now have evidence that the regulation is effective and clearly see significant progress taking place. The average CO2 emissions of new cars dropped from just below 160 grams CO2 per kilometer back in 2007 to 132 grams last year. That is quite substantial achievement. It's a reduction of 17% in only five years' time. I will argue that that would not have happened in the same dimension had it not been for the legislation. It helps some think when you put up legislation. I think that's also why, for instance, the Americans, we saw the curbs now, that they are also planning actually to regulate for, for, for trucks. So that's in the pipeline uh, in the United States. But I must say I congratulate the industry for these successes. I really think it is a success. And I must say that you will, uh, or, or I, I hope that you will agree with me that it's an impressive achievement over only a few years, but that EU regulation played an important part. There will be those who argue that that will come automatically. Uh, I think having been dealing with climate change for quite a while as a politician, I know that not a lot here comes very automatically. Heavy duty vehicles due to emissions have not yet been tackled. They represent about one quarter of road transport CO2 emissions. You will understand that that is significant, as it then is some five to six percent of the total EU greenhouse gas emissions. It is actually almost the same as shipping and aviation combined, some other sectors that we are, of course, also trying to find ways forward with. If you have regularly increasing freight transport volumes in the EU, these emissions have been rising despite improvements in vehicle fuel consumption and CO2 performance. And they need to be addressed. If we do not act, they will not go down of their own accord and will at best remain stable, representing an increasing share of EU emissions since other sectors are forced to get their emissions down they're actually doing it. Our 2011 roadmap for moving to a competitive, low-carbon economy by 2050 is looking beyond the 2020 objectives, setting out a cost-effective pathway towards 2050. EU greenhouse gas emissions need to be reduced in the dimension of 80 to 95 percent by the middle of this century. That's sort of the daunting task we have ahead of us. These targets have been confirmed by the European Council time and again. This is something that the European leaders really want to happen. Every sector of the economy, therefore, must contribute. Specifically, transport emissions need to decrease by around 60% by 2050 compared to 1990. We know that these are ambitious objectives, but we also believe that it is achievable. In March 2011, the Commission followed up on the low carbon economy roadmap to adopting the transport white paper. This outlines the main challenges facing transport, including the volatility of oil prices and the need to reduce emissions. It sets out a future transport strategy with a number of actions in order to achieve these objectives. The Commission has also launched a consultation on the 2030 climate and energy framework, and we are now preparing a proposal having analyzed all stakeholder contributions, including, by the way, the one from ASEA. The Commission is planning to publish this policy framework for 2030 on the 22nd of January. Uh, it goes without saying that that is not just about climate change being parked there in a the corner. It's about competitiveness, it's about energy costs, it's about innovation, it's about research, it's about how in the totality we can try to make a more sustainable kind of economy in Europe. I think it's no coincidence that the number one in the World Bank, Mr. Jim Kim, 
number one in IMF, Mrs. Christine Lagarde, and number one in OECD, Angel Guria. They have all, when they are talking about the economic development and growth also in Europe, they say we must get it right on climate change in order to get our economies right. So that is, of course, why we also plan to act on CO2 emissions for heavy duty vehicles and address these emissions in a stepwise manner. The first need is to address what we characterize as the knowledge gap on HDV CO2 emissions. Contrary to car and van emissions, emissions from trucks are not certified or monitored. This is due to a number of factors, notably the huge variety of vehicles on the road. As you know, and as many of the representatives of the sector have regularly pointed out to us, there is little in common between a long-haul truck and a truck collecting municipal waste, just to take one example. So that's one example where, of course, we incorporate the input from the sector, and we need that input from the sector in order to make meaningful, uh, meaningful regulation. But to address this knowledge gap, by obtaining the emissions data, we have chosen, in close co coordination with industry, a simulation approach as being the most efficient and also the most cost effective. A couple of years ago, we initiated the development of a simulation methodology that will measure HDV fuel consumption and CO2 emissions. And I'm pleased to report that we now have achieved a good level of accuracy with this method. This encourages us to continue and complete its development. I would particularly like to thank a number of you uh, for your company's support and contributions to this exercise. Without extensive industry input and support, notably by providing vehicles for the tests, these developments could not have taken place. Subsequently, we intend to propose new legislation on HDV CO2 emission certification and reporting. In this way, I'm confident that in a not too distant future, we shall have addressed and closed this knowledge gap. Vehicle purchasers will be able to compare one vehicle with another, and in this way, increased transparency can contribute to having the best performing trucks being rewarded. This competition will improve overall vehicle performance. And I'm not going to all the good reasons to have this increased transparency because I heard very clearly from Dr. Bannon that you were saying that we need full transparency. So I think that there we are working uh, along the same lines and we're looking forward to the continued uh, cooperation of, of that. But of course, transparency is only one next step. We of course also plan further steps to curb HDV CO2 emissions. In my view, and as I have mentioned at the start of my presentation, efficiency standards have worked well and have proven successful for cars. While I acknowledge that trucks are not just big cars, and very well understand that, I think that this is the right way to go also for trucks. Other countries in the world have already introduced efficiency standards, and I think this is also the way to go in Europe. Uh, I must admit that due to what I mentioned, uh, the, the knowledge gap, but also in respecting what the industry have said very, very clearly, don't just copy-paste what you're doing for cars and vans. We are moving not very fast on this file. Uh, some of you might not regret that. For my taste, it's a bit too slowly. But I think that it is very important that whatever we come up with in the end, that is something that makes sense for those who are actually in their daily life dealing with the trucks. So that is sort of the plans at, the, at, at this stage. Uh, we're trying to move forward as far, fast as we can on this particular regulation. Uh, and I was, as I said, encouraged that you sort of understand that this, although you have been doing things, it's not the end of the road. Other sectors will have to do relatively more if transport is not sort of bending the curve. So we have a joint challenge there. I think the continued very good dialogue here between my services and your experts is what we need so that we can say uh, to our citizens that all sectors are truly contributing there. Uh, I saw that this uh, headline for the conference, innovative, fuel efficient, you could say that is not just for trucks, 
we need to have a whole society run in an innovative and fuel efficient manner. And the better contributions we can come up with also for trucks, the bigger legitimacy I think that you will have as a sector also with the citizens and the consumers. So thank you very much. Looking forward to the continued very good cooperation. as well, maybe you would like to, but just a couple. Do we have some questions for the Commissioner? We have a, a, the microphone here. I'm sorry, I can't see very well with the light. Yes, we have a uh, question there. Yes, uh, good, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Fuenzanta Martinez from um, ASEA. And uh, my question is the following, and it is addressed to um, uh, Ms. Um, uh, the, the Commissioner. Um, you've made reference to um, knowledge gap, and I think that you have highlighted uh, the concern that this has uh, been uh, produced in, 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 your, uh, in, in the climate DG. Uh, do you think this is a general issue that affects other DGs, or do you think that is a, it is an issue that is a, or a specific concern of, of, of the climate uh, uh, DG? Um, and how uh, do you think that we could work together to overcome this knowledge gap? Thank you very much. Well, I think it should just go on automatically. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, whether that there is a knowledge gap of these issues in all DGs, I don't know. But I know that we need to get the methodology right in order to make intelligent regulation. It's, it's no big thing. It's, it's not so difficult to sit in your office being an expert and then you can do some kind of regulation and you can be inspired maybe from what you did for cars and vans. But as it is not the same, we need to work with industry and that is our general approach. We try to work with different stakeholders because that is you who have the detailed knowledge. So what others are doing I do not know, but this is what we do. And uh, my understanding from my services is that there is already a rather extended cooperation with the business sector. And I see the sector the Secretary General is nodding on this and we will continue to do that. Uh, because else we would come up with regulation where you cannot sort of see your own sector in it and it will not work. It will be bad regulation basically. Can I just ask Dr. Bernard your view on this, whether the, the closing of the, of the knowledge gap will really help to get the sort of legislation that would suit you as the industry? Uh, our trucks uh, customers are businessmen and uh, contrary to passenger cars where you buy passenger cars for going on vacation and look good, these guys don't want to look good, they want to make money. So what's a safer way to make calculations based on hard facts? If we can provide good data for them, so they compare shapes and sizes and all kinds of uh, trucks and competitors, we, we, we close that gap, knowledge, uh, knowledge gap we're talking about, they will be able to make good business decisions at the same point of time helping the environment. So this is what we're working on together. And this is uh, where we, we think we have a, we're on a good path and uh, with true result from our point of view, really smart regulations that really works. Can you take one more question? I'm sorry, it sounds as if we are just rushing out, but since March we said I have to leave I to I, I, really, because I, I have some other point yes, at three. Yes, so we, I'm sorry. we understand that. Oh, well, thank you very much for being with us. And thank we really you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed to the Commissioner. We, I'm just hoping that, that we might be able to squeeze more time, but obviously I understand it's, a, it's a, a packed schedule always, and we're just really grateful to have had the Commissioner here to hear the, the, those views. So we've talked about safety quite a lot already, and um, we're going to now see a video which will really give a sense of what technological advances there have been in this sector that are really making a difference now and for the future. Thank 
commercial vehicles are making significant contributions to the improvement of road safety. Today, trucks are involved in only 6% of all accidents. New technologies are making the trucks on Europe's roads even safer. Advances in automation mean that at low speeds or in traffic, trucks can drive themselves, relieving strain on the driver. A large part of the 32 billion euros the European automobile industry invests in research and development annually is spent on safety measures. These include automatic emergency braking systems, which automatically apply the brakes when onboard sensors detect an imminent collision, and lane departure warning systems, which help ensure the vehicle stays in lane. driver's attention is waning and warn them of the need to take a break. are doing their part to ensure that people, goods and services are delivered safely, efficiently and on time. So I should just say that unless you are Jean-Claude Van Damme, don't try that at home because it just really... If we say 6% of accidents, that nearly was another accident. Possibly, but no, no, we know those trucks are staying alongside, so that's good. Now, our next keynote speaker, we're very happy to have with us Olga Senorogo, uh, Euro MP, member of the Socialists and Democrats, and of course on the Transport Committee of the European Parliament. And Mrs. Senorogo is going to give her view about the future of transport, the role that trucks will play in that future, alongside rail and other transport modes. So, Mrs. Senorogo, thank you very much. First of all, let me thank you for having me here, for inviting me. Uh, I was asked to uh, give a speech uh, at this conference, the title of which is uh, The Truck of the Future, Innovative, Fuel Efficient and Safe. And in fact, uh, I will probably start uh, where uh, Mrs. Commissioner has ended. Let me tell you that I frankly see this title not really incorrect, but rather narrow-minded. In my view, it is simply necessary to start thinking the way that uh, would allow us to read the title of today's conference as follows. The transport of the future, innovative, fuel efficient and safe. I'm reluctant of giving a speech only on one particle transport mode, while, uh, while we all know that transport is a complex field and has many aspects, including different transport modes that do coexist, but should rather cooperate. I believe that also the car manufacturers are part of the big stakeholders family that should not only respond to the demand of their potential customers and shareholders, but in a broader sense should also help the society to meet exactly the goal expressed in the slightly changed title of this conference, having innovative, fuel efficient and safe transport. Let us call it, if you want, the corporate social responsibility in transport. The stakeholders have to help our societies to find a way out of an unsustainable way it is moving on. You do not have to be an expert, just look around. Transport must not be seen as a killer. Transport should not be seen as something that compromises our environment and should be perceived as a source of prosperity, not new form of slavery for people that work in this field. 
this is what has to be discussed when talking about transport policy. It is in fact the policy of our society and thus also acknowledged. And this is also what I want to talk about to you today as well. So I may be a little bit provocative. So I will start with a question. What is the future? Are we talking about next 5, 10, 20 or 30 years? The White Paper on Transport has set its vision until 2050. Do we really know in this uh, such a fast changing world and technologies what the world will look like in 40 years? 40 years ago it was the year 1973, do you remember? Since then there has been a tremendous increase in traffic and the Commission estimates uh, in its white paper 80% further increase in transport compared to 2005. Where do we put all the traffic? Where shall we put all the load? The big debate about the modal shift or commodality is in my view a little bit artificial because it uh, looks at different transport modes but not in a holistic way on transport as a whole. If we talk about the modal shift we have to make all necessary conditions to make it happen but having in mind the efficiency of transport as a whole. The cooperation between different modes of transport in this regard is a must and should be seen as an absolute priority. This is a future how I see it. I see the way for innovations right here. Better planning, better logistic chains, better use of resources, including the human resources. Talking about efficiency, we have to take into consideration all aspects. Time and of course money are only two out of many others. We have to take on board the externalities, impact, on the environment, safety aspects, traffic congestion, impact on the infrastructure and its appropriation, but also, and by far not least, the social aspects. I call it a human dignity, or maybe just as simple as human touch. This is also part of the social responsibility I was talking about at the beginning. And that brings me to the last attribute of this conference, the safety. It is just unacceptable to see people die on the roads. About 30,000 people in the Europe die in the car accidents and 4,200 road deaths are related with trucks. It is not a natural price we pay as a society. I fully support the Vision Zero. The road accident has to be seen as something exceptional, as for instance in the aviation, for example, and we have to make step-by-step -step focused changes and improvements to the complexity of the road safety aspects. The vehicle, the infrastructure, the driver, and of course the rules and enforcement, which inevitably go hand in hand with the responsibility of a society. Design of the vehicles does contribute. Keeping the vehicle in a good roadworthy condition, including of course the cargo securing, does contribute. We hope to finish the negotiations with the Council on the Roadworthiness Package as the Parliament in the coming few weeks. Then active and passive safety features we saw, but also like the ECO, for example, do matter. Being the rapporteur also for the regulation on the type approval uh, of the in-vehicle 112 ECO, I wish we introduced the EU-wide ECO emergency system as soon as possible, because more delay means more lost lives. We would like the, the Commission to explore the possibility to include the trucks into the system as well. The state of maintenance of the infrastructure does contribute as well. Too often we see dangerous deep trolleys, the result of bad roads that were not properly designed for heavy vehicles and also due to the overrating. That is affecting the road safety not only concerning the trucks. The investment in the infrastructure maintenance and building of a new reasonable connections, including the cross-border ones, is needed. There are indeed huge differences between the member states and also between different regions in the member states. This is also about the cohesion that brings with growth and employment. And of course the driver. I would say this is the pillar of road safety, no matter of any safety innovations. 
their driving skills, but also their responsibility to behave in a safe manner. We all know that the time and the business pressure on the, uh, on the undertakings in the competitive environment are passed in a large extent to the drivers. The result is stress and fatigue. This is why there has to be a shared responsibility with their undertakings. Yes, once again, is it so naive to talk about the social responsibility? If yes, then there has to be rules and enforcement. This is another room for innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, I started with changing the title of the, of the conference. After saying what I said, let me finish with one more change in the title. How do I see the truck of the future? I would have defined this way. The trucks and people who make them move from inside and outside will be responsible to our society. And our society as a whole will be innovative, fuel efficient and safe. How does it sound to you? Thank you for your attention. We were hoping that possibly you'd be able to take some questions, but you're also in a rush, so we can't take it. Um, does anybody have any, any thoughts on uh, what we've been hearing so far, um, in terms of, uh, certainly in terms of what the Commissioner was, was pointing out, and the closing of the, the knowledge gap she was talking about? We've got a silence there. No? Well, keep the tweets coming in. Um, I think we're going to break for coffee now, and we're going to come back for our, uh, our panel discussion, which is basically, we're talking about the truck of the future. How do we get that truck of the future on the road? So we'll have our panel discussion after the coffee break. So thank you very much indeed to all of our contributors so far. Via Twitter, via Twitter and on Facebook. Um, the question was asked how trucks will evolve in the future. Um, one person said they will smartly use hybrid technologies to increase energy efficiency and to decrease emissions and operating costs. Um, somebody else says vehicle tracking and real-time telematics built in as standard, providing drivers and managers with critical on-road info. More driver feedback on how to use it more efficiently. So anyway, those are the sort of tweets we've been getting. Um, we also had a video content that was on, I say we, I mean this is a say, that they had video content that on their website. Let's just have a quick look at, uh, before I introduce the panelists, uh, let's have a quick look at the video with, um, from the industry side, Eric Johart, and from uh, the policy maker side, Philip de Vacker, member of the European Parliament. Let's take a look at that. Trucks of the future will be smarter, safer, and cleaner. Smarter means, in first instance, that we'll see more use of technology, information technology, because trucks today, but more in the future, will be really connected. Second, they will be safer. Uh, truck manufacturers already today invest a lot in safety technology, and they will continue doing in the future. And last but not least, they will be cleaner. All truck manufacturers have embraced sustainability in the way they develop new trucks. This will be even more important in the future. Well, keep innovating. 
I really believe that innovation is the key to a more sustainable future. And we, as policymakers, should make sure to promote innovation, but also make sure that this is done in a technological, neutral way. So we should adapt our legislation to that. Other measures will also be needed. Next to better aer aerodynamics, I believe that the switch to alternative fuels is needed and will, will take place in the near future. I also think that the efficiency will improve. And again, all these things have to come together to make sure that we can go with the growing transport demand. So there you are, just a, a little bit of an idea of some of the thoughts. So our question is, how do we get the truck of the future on the road? Let me introduce our panelists to you. First of all, Cindy Miller, President of UPS Europe. Welcome to you. Um, I was going to be introducing Fotis Kalimitsos, who is Deputy Director General of DG MOVE, but he's in council. So, you drew the short straw, but we're very happy to have you with us. Um, uh, Christian Hedberg, who is Head of Unit for Road Transport. Uh, Transport. Is there still a possibility that, that you might have to change over? <laughs> and Jost Hedberg, thank you very much for, for being, being here, because as you know, the Commissioner couldn't take any questions. So we're thrilled that you're here, because it's uh, Director General of DG Climate Action. So any questions we didn't get a chance to put to the Commissioner, I'm sorry, but they're going to come your way. And, uh, and then, of course, we have Wolfgang Bernhardt, who is CEO of Daimler, and uh, with us again. So thank you very much indeed. Um, Cindy Miller, may I start with you? Because I just want to get a sense of what it's like out there on the road. Give me um, UPS Europe. What scale is it? I mean, how many trucks do you have on, on the road? What's your fleet like? I think uh, it's important to put some things into perspective because what I end up here is I'm, I'm a, a consumer of, of the, the great efficiencies and the products that uh, companies like Daimler and several others put, put, uh, put forth um, and also dependent on an awful lot of the policy and the legislation that is passed throughout Europe. So I'll put UPS into perspective as a logistics company. Um, UPS globally is in 220, company, uh, 220 countries around the world and carries about 2% of the global GDP. So here in Europe, that translates into um, Europe for UPS consists of about maybe 48,000 employees. Uh, we have about just shy of 9,000 vehicles, UPS vehicles that are on the road every day here. Um, we, uh, UPS around the world carries about 16.1 million packages every day, a very large portion of that obviously with, with uh, European transport um, goes back and forth across borders here uh, every day. So we, we've got a very big stake in many things. Uh, we've, we're, we're very interested in making sure that our vehicles are as efficient as possible. As uh, Dr. Bernard had said before, consumers of those types of products, it's very important that they are all running as efficiently as they possibly can. Uh, we're a very big proponent of driver training and driver safety. Uh, from our perspective, making sure that every one of our drivers uh, comes to work every day and you know do, is, has the ability to do their job and do it in a very safe manner. Because uh, we're not just concerned, we certainly are concerned about that driver, but we're also concerned to make sure that there's a lot of people dependent on whatever it is that they're transporting. So we, we um, as, as a large logistics provider, we are very interdependent with all the other groups uh, here in Europe to make sure that Europe moves forward uh, with investment and with engagement because as someone had said, 90% I think of, of everything that, that someone is going to touch or need uh, has to be handled and transported over the road and we're a very big portion of that. So um, it's a very interesting conference and a great opportunity for me to be here representing UPS. So if I ask you the question then, what is your idea of the truck of the future? I mean, do you think that you, you've already got the truck of the future? I mean, for instance, we talk about fuel efficiency um, and we're saying that this is market driven to a certain extent because I presume that fuel costs are a massive, massive part of your overall cost. Sure, sure. I mean, do you need legislation? Well, I think um, one of the things at UPS that I think is very, very good is we believe in a, in a concept called constructively dissatisfied. Um, constructively dissatisfied. So every day, uh, when companies like ours don't, we don't make anything. You, you're not buying our secret sauce, you're not buying a special drink, you're not, we, we, we merely provide service. And every day, our goal is to make sure that we're better than we were today. That's a constructive dissatisfaction. 
And I think the healthy thing uh, that we're talking about at a conference like this, whether it's with um, specific industry experts, whether it's policymakers, is there has to be a level of that same degree of constructively being dissatisfied that something can always be done better tomorrow. And when, we, when you ask the simple question, do we have the truck of the future at this moment? I would say no. Um, just as I would say, have, has, has UPS as the largest logistics company in the world perfected the supply chain? I would have to also say no. Um, there's always an opportunity to do something better tomorrow, and I think as long as policy, as long as final legislation, and as long as uh, industry experts continue to work together to find out exactly what the best solutions are uh, moving forward, I think that constructive dissatisfaction will continue to drive um, I, and I, one of the really things, the, the things I'm most proud of is being here in Europe where it is so, uh, it, it does lead the rest of the world. And there's, there's a pride that I think you can feel that's palpable over that leadership. But I think, um, I think that leadership needs to make sure that, that all voices at the table are heard and in, in order to find the next best thing to move tomorrow forward. So, Christine Hedgott, maybe I could ask you, I mean, are you uh, constructively dissatisfied with the, with the industry? I mean, how does it work from your point of view? How do you see the truck of the future should, should be developing with some, you know, I mean, obviously you're working on your, your weights and dimensions directive, so that must be kind of a key thing that uh, is at the heart of your thinking. Yes, many, th many thanks, and again, uh, apologies for the, for the hierarchy, who is uh, a little bit busy elsewhere. I think Mr. Jonat probably captured in three words uh, the Commission's, Vice President Kallis and, and, and the Commission's vision of the truck of the future, the, the, the greener, safer, uh, smarter animal. Are we constructively uh, critical, not of the industry, but uh, I look at the very impressive display of hardware at the, at the, at the entrance of, the, of, the, of, of this place, which I think definitely uh, represents the state of the art today. Uh, but for the future, I think we still have something a little bit different uh, in mind. I mean, the starting point has to be that Europe, the, the whole economic organization of the European Union, is critically dependent on the truck. There will be millions of trucks on Europe, Europe's roads for the foreseeable future. And therefore, it is certainly in the interest of every European that each and every truck is as environmentally efficient, as safe, um, as smart as possible. You refer to, to what we can do to achieve this goal in our policy area. In addition to what, what, uh, what uh, Commissioner Hedegaard and, and Mr. Del Beke are doing in their policy area, on the, on the transport side, we have submitted as, as a stakeholders here present very well know, uh, a proposal, in fact, to amend and to update the, the directive regulating the dimensions and weights of, uh, of trucks. We think that by allowing additional flexibility to the manufacturers to conceive a new cab of the truck, you can improve the aerodynamic performance of the vehicles. But is it additional flexibility if it's legislation? It is additional flexibility because the pres present uh, directive puts a limit on the maximum dimensions of the vehicles, which has resulted in the present vehicle that we see on Europe's roads uh, engaged in international traffic. Uh, and within these parameters, the present uh, uh, design is, I'm sure, largely optimized but by allowing additional flexibility going beyond the dimensions which are today in the, in the, in the stipulated in the legislation, you would have the possibility to firstly improve the aerodynamic profiling of the, of the truck with, uh, with corresponding benefits not only on fuel consumption but also and therefore operating costs for the, for the hauliers but also on emissions and thereby benefits in terms of uh, pollution and clean air for uh, the European society. But similarly, in this context, we are very much driven by the safety considerations. It is the stakeholders here present, both the vehicle, the hardware manufacturers, the representatives of vulnerable road users, the represent representatives of, of uh, NGOs uh, dealing with the environmental issues, 
who have uh, drawn our attention to the fact that if you conceive the truck and the cab anew, you have potential for important safety improvements. Although, of course, we saw the video, didn't we, before, where the, the, the obviously technology is, is, is really already performing incredibly well, so it seems. Absolutely, technology is, uh, is, has endless possibilities and is, uh, is, is performing well, as you say. But there are also uh, elements uh, related to the concept of the conception, the design of the cab itself, which can give an additional or alternative way of improving safety. For pedestrians, vulnerable road users such as bikers, you can improve the, the, the field of vision of the, of the drivers. You can, by having additional uh, flexibility in the dimensions, you can uh, build into the, into, the, into the nose of the truck various safety features, a zone which, uh, which acts as an additional absorber of the impact on, in, in, in case of collisions. You can have a more, more curved shape of the, of the front of the truck, which I will, obviously it doesn't make a huge difference if a truck is traveling at 80 kilometers an hour and, and you're hit as a pedestrian by that truck on, 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 on the side of a highway, highway. On the other hand, it makes a huge difference in the urban environment where trucks may be traveling only at 15 or 20 kilometers an hour, whether you are deflected to the side of the truck or whether you end up underneath the truck. Okay, kind of, uh, so that's your, your vision of the future of, of the truck. What about from DG Climate's point of view? I mean, do you two, do you speak together, you DGs? You know, you... you I, no, because, I mean, I'm very interested in that because we see this in so many policy areas that actually that doesn't happen. So do you work together on something like this? We are very intensively working together. In fact, uh, uh, the, the, the DG Climate Action uh, is small given the task ahead and in fact we make it as a standard uh, kind of working uh, procedure that we talk intensively and work intensively with our colleagues uh, for example what we did on cars and I'm sure the Commission mentioned it uh, we uh, did not only work with our colleagues from DG Enterprise but also with those making the methodologies at the JRC and the whatever. So we bring all stakeholders together from outside the Commission but we start of course inside the Commission. So in that sense uh, we have very strong cooperation and I, I think that's the, the modern way of doing things. We are preparing a new package on 2030. Uh, it would be an illusion for us to think we can do it on our own. We have to do it with our colleagues from DG Energy, ECFIN, Competition, Enterprise. You know, that, that's, that's a standard way uh, of working in, in, in the Commission and then the DG Climate Action, we attach a lot of importance to that. And the Commission made it very clear that there have to be standards. And I mean, that the, the industry can't do it on its own. She, she recognized how much was being done by the industry, but said, you know, it's not, it, it can't happen on, on its own. Well, that's the point we reached. We worked very corporately and very intensively with the industry. Uh, uh, lorries are very different in, in the way they, they operate and the way they are constructed, etc. So we worked very intensively together to have a measurement tool and a simulation tool to, to know better and to make the performance of lorries compatible. And I think that was a major step ahead. We are finalizing that in the coming months and, 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 and I hope in the not too distant future. But at the same time, we feel there is a need to uh, bring the market barriers down. That is that um, we think there is legislation needed for certification and for uh, reporting of the performance of, uh, of trucks, not only for the new market, but also for the second-hand market. So it is a market supportive measure it's not a measure to substitute for the market, but it's to make the market work better. Because uh, we know that the truck is being written off more, mostly in, in a short period of time, three years, four years, but the life of a truck is, is 10 years or more. And so uh, the, uh, the second-hand market is, is as important to bring down emissions as the, as the newest trucks. Now, having said that, uh, technology is important and fuel efficiency is of capital importance, but also uh, other fuel trucks and the hybrid technology is going to be something that will be driven into the market. So it's less fuel and less fossil fuel uh, that we have to go for.
And in terms of, you know, you said, obviously we've all, many people have said that how important trucks are at various points of, you know, just to keep the economy on the move. But in your heart of hearts, would you like to see more happening on rail than, on, than in trucks? Well, it all depends. We have to optimize the different modes of transport together. I think uh, uh, we have to valorize indeed the role of rail. Uh, we did that for passenger transport, uh, where we are having no longer um, aviation flights between Brussels and Paris, for example, because the train is so efficient in terms of uh, time, in terms of comfort, in terms of flexibility and things like that. So we have to optimize different uh, roads and, and ways of working. So we will uh, refrain from imposing out of our legislation something that is going to say only rail for this and nothing but something else for something. You know, that's not the way we regulate. We regulate normally in a technologically neutral manner. That is what we did for cars, that is what we did for vans, and that is what delivered the result. Fuel efficiency and also a switch to low carbon fuels and possibly electricity if the market decides that's the way to go, then that's fine with us. It may also be hydrogen or something else. We leave that to the car manufacturers and to those developing the technology to make their decisions. That's not for us to prescribe. Okay, so Dr. Bernhard, you're nodding. What's your view on what you've heard so far? I've heard, um, first of all, I agree with both of the stuff that's been said. Um, especially, I really welcome uh, what has been done on the Commission in order to start a discussion about weights and dimensions. I, I really appreciate uh, because we would never expected it uh, uh, from coming out of that corner, so it's really, really good. Um, in order to um, qualify what we can do in the front and the rear, I've already said in my speech that we think that in the rear of the trucks where not much has been done so far, this is where the biggest opportunity are, is you know, in terms of how much does it cost to change things and what's the effect of it. The rear is still completely open and we can do, in very short periods of time, we can achieve great things. So this is where I would put the emphasis, not at the front. But really, Second, sorry to interrupt, but just if you, if you talk about redesigning a cab, how much does it cost? It costs millions and billions. I mean, redesigning a cap, we're always talking about 300, 400 millions in all the kinds of testing that you have to need to do and all the tools that you have to change and all the changes you have to do in the factory. This is big, right? But designing a couple of CO2 flaps at the rear of a trailer, it's no big deal. It's a couple of hundred bucks, right? And you can do it from one year to the next, right? So if you get the right incentives in place, if you allow for it, what right now is being discussed, we, this is great, that's stuff we can do immediately. So this is one thing I would like to uh, say. Second thing I would like to qualify, um, in terms of safety, think about it. A truck that travels at 80 kilometers an hour has a lot of energy, right? It, it, a, a, a passenger car, same energy with two tons is roughly traveling at 400 kilometers an hour, right? So think about a passive safety feature that allows to absorb an energy of the passenger car for 400 kilometers per hour. It's simply impossible. Right? The front overhang would be probably a couple of hundred meters right? to allow that impact to happen for 400 kilometers per hour. So what we say is the only way to, to, to push safety in a truck is not by trying to diminish the result of an impact, but avoid the impact to happen in the first place. So this is where we have to go, right? The, the point is prevent the accident from happening at all. This is our dream, that's our vision. It's been said today, you know, it's just the, the vision of accident-free driving. And there's a lot of out there, I can assure you, if you look at the passenger car side, there's a lot of stuff being developed. If we just take that stuff, take it over to the truck industry, there's a lot that we can do all the way up to driverless driving of trucks. Right? So this is also a vision, you know, have the truck drive itself with the technology in there, and it might be more safe. So last thing I would like to say, um, 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 we have uh, heard Connie Hedegaard, and she's, she has a vision of uh, CO2 carbon reduction 
of roughly all the way up to 80%. You heard the targets, 2050. If we don't start to rethink weight and dimensions, we will never get there. We will never get there, right? I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Now we're talking 40 centimeters, half a meter in the front. If you give that same dimension in the back, right, of a trailer, let's say, if you allow for a 16 meter trailer, right, you get 30% in fuel efficiency. Also something that can be done very fairly quickly. And I understand we talked about it, right now there's no political appetite. Nobody will, uh, will want to have this discussion right now. But if we want to move on on the CO2 target, we have to put these things into, into, into the picture again. And, and let me just one, one last thing make clear. I have no interest uh, to put that from a business point of view. I will exchange three, trailer, uh, three, three tractors by two tractors because the industry will need less, right? What three tractors could pull in the past, we only need two tractors because the trailers will be longer. And the trailer industry has no interest in that because we're going to exchange three trailers for two trailers, right? So the industry has no self-interest in putting these longer lorries out in the field. No, we're not. But it's the right thing to do from a CO2 point of view. It's the right thing to do from a consumer point of view. It reduces traffic density on the on the on the freeways and so on and so forth. So this is the this is a thing that we will put on the agenda and start to get discussed again because beyond 2020, there's not much else we can do. Christian Hedgold, you wanted to come in and then Cindy Miller. Thank you. No, just very briefly, I think first of all, a point needs to be made that the, the openness and, and constructive engagement by, by Dr. Bernard and, and his company and the other hosts here present is of course critical because it's one thing for us to talk about these concepts, but, uh, but it is their companies who in the end will put them on the market. But this discussion on whether one should concentrate the effort on the back of the truck or at the, at the front end, I think uh, is, not, is not one that even needs to be concluded. The, proposal that the Commission has tabled I think is interesting precisely in the in the sense that it is conceived as enabling legislation. It doesn't force anybody to do anything. It opens up the possibility and people uh, in, in light of their expectation of what the, what, where the demand on the market lies will concentrate their efforts either on the back end, on the front end or on the total um, concept. It is enabling legislation, not mandatory. And I think that will help the market also as a, as a function of, uh, of, uh, of cost benefit and experience to show what, where the demand of the, of the operators uh, lies. And as, um, as the end consumer um, of the, the different technologies, I'll just share with you some specifics. We ran a test in, uh, ran a test in the, uh, the North Rhine-Westphalia area of Germany from 2007 to 2008. Um, and what we did was we experimented with the longer <clears throat> echo combis, uh, so longer vehicles during that period of time. So we, we marked it for a year. We've been in Germany doing operations since 1976, so it isn't, it, it's, we've had years and years and years of statistics, years and years of, of engineering and, and understanding. In that one year time period, we were able to reduce, to, it's same customers, same area, growth rate, um, <laughs> everything being pretty much the same. In a one-year time period, we reduced fuel by 21,700 liters. We reduced our miles driven, or our kilometers driven, by 70,000. So there was a 70,000 reduction uh, in kilometers driven. And I think the most important thing is in that experiment, during that time period, uh, there were 57.2 less tons of CO2 uh, during, that, during that one year time period. Now, when, when, when we talk about it from a theoretical perspective, when we talk about it uh, from a, a simulated perspective, there's an actual example of, of, of one area in, in one country for one year um, and just in, in support of what Dr. Bernard had said, we, we, we've that's why UPS is a very big proponent and many other, many other um, logistics companies are of the longer vehicles for that reason. It, it's, it's good from, certainly from our perspective. It's also good from a corporate sustainability responsibility perspective. And uh, those are hard facts that you just can't get away from. 
and with your fleet size, I presume in, in many areas you could be a sort of rolling laboratory and test out different technologies. And it's a, it's a, it's a, just we, we've got 2,500 alternative uh, vehicles in our fleet today, and we're one of the largest around the world. Um, and of those 2,500, since, uh, and let's say, I love the concept that rolling laboratory, um, you, you learn everywhere you are, you learn the things that go well, you learn things that aren't well, you learn things that need improvement from, from our partnership with suppliers and, and uh, producers, you learn what you need uh, from support from legislation and policy. Um, and, and what we've seen during that time period from 2000 to 2012, We've logged, um, we, we, we've logged three, 395 million kilometers during that time period with alternative fuel vehicles. Um, to, to put that in perspective, that's the distance as if we drove from Earth to Mars and came back. Uh, so that, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of kilometers. We've had a chance to learn an awful lot of things. Um, and we've learned things like, um, you know, the, the ability to supply, the ability, which vehicle can handle long, longer haul, which vehicles uh, are, are um, require more maintenance, which vehicles, which, which types of alternative fuels have long-term viability, which ones don't. And we've continually fed information to a lot of the, um, the research and development companies from both the fuel perspective and also from the, um, the automotive and the, the trucking industry um, producers. And I think that, that that rolling laboratory is, is critical and it's key. And that's where I think we have a responsibility, companies like the pieces have a responsibility to say, okay, here's, here's what it was in theory, and here's how it's worked, and here's what we found out from this, as you would put it, rolling laboratory. But also, are you also feeding that information towards policymakers as well? I mean, you know, key information like that. Well, I'll tell you, it's um, one of the things that I'm very appreciative of is this type of a conference. Uh, this type of, of efforts um, uh, that are done here locally, uh, any opportunity that we have, I think the more, um, from, from what we had heard earlier, and certainly from the distinguished panelists here today, um, I believe that, that the appetite is certainly open for that, type of, uh, for that type of collaboration. And I think I'm very encouraged, whereas companies can be looked at as part of the solution as opposed to continually being tomorrow's headline as part of the problem. And when I, I think the more we move forward with that, um, I, I, think, I think the better everyone will be. Maybe you're still there, I could bring you in on that because um, I know that the Commissioner said this morning that she couldn't help this morning, wasn't this morning, seen like this morning, it was an hour or so ago, um, that she was, she was frustrated in a way that it wasn't moving, things were not moving as quickly as she might like and it's true that any legislative thing is going to take a long, long time but yet you hear what the industry is doing, what Cindy is explaining here. Um, I mean, could, do you see that there could be perhaps even a even closer relationship with industry to, to try to work on the issues? Well, just to, to give a, an image on, or a picture on why um, the Hedegaard may have sounded a bit frustrated, that is that in all segments of society, emissions of greenhouse gas emissions go down, except on transport. In fact, what we achieve in the power sector and the manufacturing sector is to a large extent neutralized by the increase of emissions from the transport sector. And I think that uh, what we try to do is tackle the vehicle, the product, from a European perspective. And, and I think that worked well on cars and vans. I hear it is working well on fuel, on, 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 uh, on, on trucks. Um, if it is helpful uh, to go into legislation on certification and reporting, yeah, we, we can do that. But it is the truck. I would uh, think that we need a more comprehensive view in the future, something for the next commission, on how we organize freight transportation in Europe. Uh, that's a very important question. It's a third of the emissions from transportation. The other two thirds mainly being passenger transportation. And for transport as a whole, we have to have a fresh look at how things develop. Uh, because we get a bit of uh, uh, a, a flag when we are discussing with the power sector or with the manufacturing industry, uh, where they say, well, you're, put a little, you're putting a lot of pressure on our shoulders and we deliver. But the, what we deliver is being eaten up, neutralized by another sector. And I think that is the big picture that we have to keep in the back of our mind. And I, I take it that technology is going to be our partner, business 
uh, will be our partner, has always been our partner. Uh, when we produce uh, clean and cleaner ways, steel or cement or chemicals, it's business who is doing it. It's not uh, officials or it is not being done in the lab. It's going to, to be done in, in the real, uh, in real life business. But I think we have a problem with transport. Um, we regulate the cars better, but we all drive our cars longer, more intensively. Uh, we are blocking each other on the roads. You know, traffic management is becoming a big thing. And uh, I think we, we, we need to have a fresh look at the cluster of questions we all are facing up to some of the negative elements uh, on a daily basis. Do, do we have any thoughts from the audience? Please put your hand up, we'll get a microphone to you. There's a gentleman here. But when you say a fresh look, I mean, do, do you mean, uh, I mean, is the idea of, of investing in roads anathema to you? Because, you know, roads equals CO2 probably in the mind of DG Climate. And yet, a lot of people would say that the, the, the quality of the infrastructure, road infrastructure is so poor that it's actually contributing to the CO2 problem. It would not be DG Climate's view that we would oppose any infrastructure work. There are missing links where we could optimize our transport. We, we have not an exclusive idea on one or the other element. We have an open view on that, but it is true when every morning, uh, during the day, every weekday, we have traffic jams. Yeah. A lot of our companies are using, losing lots of money with lorries standing idle in traffic jams all around. So we can improve the infrastructure, for sure we should do that. But there is also a limit to how far you can stretch things and that's why on, 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 on freight transportation we need to have a, a comprehensive look at where we optimize lorries, where we optimize trains, where we uh, optimize uh, in, inland uh, shipping. Uh, that, that's what I, what I mean with a fresh look at how we organize things. You want to come in briefly and then this gentleman here? Yes, I, I just, I, I find it interesting that at some points in time with talking about infrastructure improvement, we talk about there being limits, but we believe that fuel efficiencies and the ability to continue to improve things is limitless. And I think that, um, you know, we, we've got to, um, we, we believe in, take as an example, some of the, some of the road charging, and we've had a, an, an earlier discussion about it. Um, Road charging is, is, is certainly an issue that, that needs to become far more harmonized and understood, um, but I think that that's one piece of it. The second piece of it that I think we really need to take a look at is earmarking and, and making a good bit of those road charges um, across Europe, which will help facilitate the, the flow of, of, uh, of goods and services. But I think then earmarking some of those funds so they are specifically used and designed because they're, they're, I don't want to say there's plenty of it that's already being collected, but there are very large amounts that companies like ours and like, like many, many other companies out there pay, and yet that money is not necessarily going back in at in, in the same proportion into that improvement. And, and it's, it's very encouraging to hear that, that, that that's understood and that that is a very big piece of this uh, because that, that, that affects that affects many things. Uh, and certainly, even a designer's ability to create, to get even more creative with, uh, with, what's, with, with the products that are being made, with what trucks are gonna be put on the road or the lorries, um, you know, maybe even some of the infrastructure can help push the design even to greater limits or, or to, to, to greater, uh, greater heights. So they're all, they're all very connected uh, and, and, and very, very important. But the earmarking of those funds back in, I think, is, is one step and one of the things we can do right off the bat in order to make, make some improvements in some inroads. Yes, sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Seisler of Clean Fuels Consulting here in Brussels. Um, UPS in the United States, uh, you're investing over 50 million uh, US dollars. I think you've got nine liquefied natural gas stations. You're going to have 13 supposedly by the end of 2014. A thousand trucks running on LNG. Uh, the gentleman to your far left, the Daimler is making the Iconic that runs on compressed natural gas, LNG, as does a Veco Volvo. How do you see, in terms of the alternative fuels, but in liquefied natural gas in particular, is uh, UPS going to be getting more engaged in that on the European side, given that you do have technology available? Uh, from the Daimler side, do you see that market as potentially 
growing in a strong way. And from the government side, here's an opportunity to reduce CO2 by 15 to 20 percent per truck or more. So there's a solution here that everybody's talking about. To what degree do we see this particular market and this particular fuel in the trucks of today and the trucks of tomorrow? Yes. All right. I'll, I'll, uh, first of all, as, uh, from, from a liqu liquefied natural gas perspective, while I'm not an expert, I will share with you um, your statistics are right on as far as what we're doing in the U.S. I'll go down to the fact that I do know, just from a very basic perspective, that it's not, that, that it's not as powerful uh, as we don't get as much energy from it as we do with diesel. So one of the things that we're finding in the U.S. as an example where policy would help is there's the same amount of tax and the same amount of fees on a liter of, of LNG as there is on diesel. And what you end up with is if you're, you're going to use twice as much of the LNG, um, you end up with uh, the disadvantage of why would I want to switch to that fuel when, when the taxation on it becomes twice as much. Uh, it also boils down to the special handling of it. Uh, it's got to be stored, it's got to be turned over in a certain period of time, it's got to be stored in a certain way, temperature controlled, and UPS is taking a very active role in trying to create a couple of our own, um, uh, our own filling stations and our own, our, our own setup, but again, nine in comparison to the scope of the United States is really, is really a rolling laboratory, uh, not a long-term solution. Uh, what we've tried in Europe, uh, and we did this for the Olympics, I was in, uh, I was a managing director for the UK during the Olympics, and what we had tried there, and I don't know if many of you are familiar with this, but a, but a biomethane gas, and uh, what we had found out, there was one supplier in all of the UK, from southern UK, in order to be able to supply that. It's a, it, 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 it afforded us the opportunity to, to use it on longer hauls, uh, with some of our product. It was it turned out to be extremely reliable, and UPS is very much uh, a proponent of being able to expand our engagement there. Again, that's one supplier in the whole country. So I think as, as, as policy moves forward, and as, uh, as, as, as consultants and companies like yours continue to move that direction, UPS, uh, we're not unique. I think, as, uh, as Dr. Bernard had said earlier, you know, end consumers and businesses figure out how to how to how to do things or, or to jump on the bandwagon of that which is most efficient, and that's why we're doing that rap, uh, rolling laboratory piece in the U.S. But we're we're we'd be very much interested in, in trying to see something with biomethane move a little bit more um, quickly or get a little bit more uh, of an appetite here in Europe. Dr. Benno. Um I think uh, that's a good question. And I would like to expand it a little bit. Um, I also read it on the Twitter that uh, people ask, uh, in the passenger car side, we, need, we see electric vehicles. When is the time when we see electric trucks out there? So I can assure you right now, um, uh, also with Daimler, we have passenger car electrical solutions out there. The techno technology that we have at hand only allows urban, most of the urban uh, applications, short-term distances. Um, the technology is not from, big problem is the battery. Uh, weight, size, and cost of the battery is not anywhere close to that we can start to thinking about hauling tonnage, how, hauling big weights and goods for long distances. So as long as the battery doesn't improve weight, size, and money by factor 20, factor 10 to 20, we don't have to talk about electric stuff. So this is for goes for electric vehicles. Now, a uh, different issue is gas. Uh, this, is a, this could be a potential game changer. Right? So what we see in the US with the shale gas revolution, um, and what we see with the abundance of this very cheap or less expensive um, fuel, available not only at certain spots, but distributed around the country. This could change the whole game because it's less expensive and it tends to be less CO2 uh, consuming. So there's a, a CO2 opportunity in there. Not a huge one, but at least another one that we haven't looked at. The issue there is how do you store this energy? There are two ways to store it. One of it is liquid, the other one is compressed. We are studying both solutions. We're having first, as you said, first applications out there already. Um, and it comes again down to how do you store uh, those, 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 the, the gas 
Um, and again, it's about containers. How do you make them safe? How do you make them light? How do you make them uh, sm as small as possible and package as good as possible to fit into what we have in weight and dimension regulation in the US just as much here? <coughs> This is something that could be a game changer for the industry. We're watching it very closely and we're developing this technology to make sure when the wave, when the wave comes, we're ready to serve it rather than to be squashed by it. Well, you talk about the, sh the shale gas revolution in the US, but we're not going to have the same in Europe, are we? <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, if... Uh, I heard some people say, um, when all the energy intensive industries are gone, Europe might rethink its position. Yeah. <laughs> so I hear already chemical industries that say, hey, we're going where the cheapest uh, energy is. Some people say, the energy price is the bread price of the future. And uh, it will decide on the fate of economies and continents. So before we throw away solutions or throw away options too fast, we do have to do some hard thinking. Christian Hamburg, you wanted to come in and then just a little bit. Yeah. Yes, I think Mr. Delberg uh, summarized it in the beginning to improve the environmental performance of, of road freight transport in Europe we need to facilitate ways of consuming less, consuming less fuel and consuming cleaner fuels. We discussed a little bit in the beginning what on the road transport side we are doing in terms of a legislative initiative to improve the first one, the, the fuel consumption performance through um, incentivizing or opening up the possibility to, to, to design new trucks, new lorries with a better aerodynamic performance. In that same legislative proposal, we also make allowances in terms of the weight of the trucks for the purpose of, uh, of uh, facilitating the uptake of alternative propulsion systems. So the, the two strands, in a way, come together in the one legislative proposal, which is now on the table. You're still there. I couldn't resist making a comment on the shale gas. I mean, nobody and the European institutions, the European Commission is not ruling out the possibility of exploring and exploiting shale gas in Europe. I think it should be very clear. You're not but, running it out, but I think the, but, the people of Europe are, are, at the moment are speaking very loudly themselves. Exactly, and that is the point I wanted to make. Uh, that is that Europe is a very different place compared to the United States in two respects. Uh, Europe is fairly densely populated compared to the United States, and the property rights in Europe are very differently organized compared to the United States. So. Uh, there may be spots and there may be places and in fact we are already fracking already for 10 20 years in europe uh, shale gas uh, so nothing wrong about that as long as we minimize the environmental impacts and we use the best technology etc etc but the uh, the hope as if a shale gas revolution may be within reach even within a decade or a bit within two decades in europe I think has to be taken with a piece of salt, mm -hmm. and that is what the International Energy Agency is telling us as well. It would be great if we would have energy inside in Europe. I mean, I'm the last to, uh, to dispute that, but so far that is not the case. Uh, Europe is running empty, and that's why for Europe, fuel efficiency and efficiency and the way we use energy is of a radical importance our import dependency is increasing every year, every year, despite all efforts related to energy efficiency and renewable energy. So we have a vulnerable side there, vulnerable in terms of physical vulnerability, but also economic vulnerability. We are at the mercy of the world's market price. We are a price taker on energy. And so the best way of weaponing us against that is to be highly fuel efficient. And I think that I welcome very much the fuel efficient trucks as our transport system should be absolutely fuel efficient. Uh, just one indicator, the price of oil has been over the last two years at the deepest of the recession depression in Europe, still between $80 and $120 per barrel. Less than 10 years, it was $30, $40 per barrel. And 
what is the explanation? <coughs> we have to import and we have to take the world price for granted. And so uh, that's why in the 2030 debate overall, we are going to put a very heavy em emphasis on fuel efficiency, efficiency in the way we use energy, and to the extent possible, of course, renewable energy. Uh, because that is the energy we uh, produce with our own brains, our own capital, and inside Europe. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, Claudie Lenz from Track and Business magazine here in Belgium. Uh, my question is rather addressed at uh, the ACEA. Uh, from what we've heard until now, truck manufacturers are not really enthusiastic about redesigning cabs. For obvious to be cost reasons, and I can understand that you need some breathing space and time to get some return on investment for the billions of euros you spent on Euro 6. Now, is that question of redesigning cabs a question of principle, is it a definitive point of view, or could that be solved with an appropriate timing? Yeah. What about that, Dr. Bernard? First of all, um, um, there are still, as uh, Cindy Miller said, that there's always room for improvement. And uh, this is not a forever answer where we say there's no possibilities at all. Uh, if I have the choice right now, if I want to get something do going fast and less expensive, I would not go for the rear, rather elaborate forever on the front. And, and I say, yes, on the front, we can do long term, no problem, we will do that. But the rear is right now uh, where we get the most bang for the buck. So this is, this is just a proposal, setting priorities. But if, if, if you had to do it, would you say that they have to have a certain time frame within which to... to and he, he said it very correctly, he said, you know, this is just opening opportunities, it's not mandating, right? So this is, we're complete uh, 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 harmony here that we're not, we're not uh, in disagreement. It's opening up the opportunities and, and if I have to, pay, to make a choice, the rear is the place to go. But I presume, I presume I, when you're, re, you're redesigning, you've got engineers all the time working. I mean, so you must be looking at the cab anyway. I mean, you know, you're looking everywhere, I presume, to see how you can improve the vehicle in some way. Uh, we just put out the truck. You can look it out there. Um, from, it improved its, uh, its fuel efficiency with the truck, new truck design that we have by 2 or 3% just by the cabin design. Of course, we're not going to throw out what we just have and start everything from scratch. As the gentleman correctly pointed out, uh, we have to make sure that all the investments we put in there, almost 2 billion euros, that some, some of that money, money comes back if we start from scratch all new. And it's, it's a fair point. More questions? Yes, gentlemen, some people there at the, at the back. Sorry, I have to run Charles with the microphone. See that he'll be warmed up. I hope everyone is a bit warmer now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Laurel Henning. I'm a journalist with Amex. A uh, question to you, Mr. Dalbecker, if I may. Uh, both yourself and uh, Commissioner Hedegaard mentioned uh, work that needs to be done on certification and reporting. Um, I was wondering if that was something that can be expected next year, or is that to coincide with uh, the redesign of reorganisation of freight transport that you mentioned for the next commission? Thank you. We have, to be absolutely clear, we have not yet fixed the timetable for this. It may well come next year, but you know next year is going to be a very special year in the Brussels fabric, and so uh, the, um, the jury is open. Um, we still have to take up that discussion, but our minds are now fully in the 2030 framework that we are preparing for the 22nd of January, and uh, so my answer is, neither a yes nor a no, things are open. Yes, gentlemen, next. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Chris Petters, uh, representing the European refining industry. Um, just a couple of comments, and then I, I've got a question for Dr. Bernard. Um, you, refiners supply 95% of the, the fuel used uh, in transport. Um, and I don't know if all you, uh, you understand that we import probably about 20% of our diesel demand into Europe. Uh, Europe is very short of diesel. As we are short of, of LNG, if we're going to increase the LNG, we, we import a huge quantity of, of LNG. 
Um, and so when you know, Joss talks about fuel efficiency to, to reduce imports, I mean, we, we would absolutely agree with him. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it may reduce our demand, but we understand this is, this is uh, something which is essential to do. Um, but I think we've hit on a couple of, of issues about competitiveness and the choice of technology, and one was mentioned was the energy density of fuels, and whether it's the battery, LNG, compressed natural gas or diesel, it's a huge, huge challenge. We, we can understand that. The other was touched on was taxation. And uh, $100 crude maybe, but most consumers pay between $200 and $250, if it's the equivalent, for their, for their fuels because of taxation. Uh, so my question to, to Dr. Bernard was, you, you, you talked about the gap on, on electric power for trucks. We're a long, long, long way away. And I think our analysis would, would agree with you. As far as um, LNG goes, leaving aside the, uh, the, the logistical issues and the, and the infrastructure, um, if you were to compare on a, an equivalent taxation basis, weight for weight, in other words, the energy content, if you were to tax LNG the same as diesel, what's, what's the gap in terms of cost and, and technology to, that we have to close for, for that to be competitive on that basis? <coughs> Uh, first of all, from a content point of view, roughly, if I take a barrel of oil that is right now at $100 per barrel, gas, let's say uh, natural gas, uh, liquid or compressed, is roughly at a quarter of that. Same energy content, that is roughly a quarter. You're talking about gas is uh, because it can very readily be, be, be had. Sometimes it's just burned as waste right now. So if you, we capture that and you transport it where, where it can be employed, roughly average price is $25. So this is the basis, right? Now we have to think about right now, um, there's no tax on those gases right now. So if, since the base of it is a quarter of the oil, um, it's fair to assume that even if you put tax on top of it to the same amount that you put it on the diesel, it'd still be an advantage, right? Still be an advantage. And um, uh, from, a, from a vehicle point of view, the challenge is not in the engine. The challenge is again in the storage. And can you provide safe and tight packaging so you can um, uh, have these gas tanks basically running around. There are solutions, They're out. we're already out there um, in, in the field with some of those applications. We have buses running on gas, we have uh, passenger cars running on gas, we have, uh, even in the US, we have some trucks running on gas. Um, uh, the, 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 the big challenge is to get the cost for those containers down. This is what we're working on. As numbers increase, I am pretty much confident that these costs will come down. Right now, I'll just give you a number. Uh, for a long haul truck in the US, uh, these changes cost 55,000 US dollars. That's still too high. We think if you can get, if you half that, then it becomes interesting. Can you half that number? I think we can. So it's an, an, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of time, and it's a question of you know getting our engineers to get the job done, and getting our suppliers to, to keep up. So I think again, it's not a done deal. It's a it's a uh, it could be a game changer, right? We're not sure about it, but we're getting ready. Cindy, what's your uh, view on the economics of it all? Your experience. So for, and, and again, uh, as we had shared a little bit earlier with the alternative uh, fuels with LNG or, or uh, uh, the compressed natural, uh, natural gas, uh, currently in, in its current state, it is, it is just not as reliable and it's not as advanced as it needs to be. Uh, it's why UPS is kind of trying, uh, we're one of many companies that are trying our own ex uh, set of experiments with it because what we want to see is its durability, uh, its, its, its power ability, and all those other things with it is still unknown. But the only way you ever figure out whether or not it's viable is you've got to dive into it, which is why we're doing what we're doing um, and what many other companies are. And we don't know what the answer is going to be because at the same time as LNG and you know those types of efficiencies are being worked on, the continuing efficiencies 
uh, with, there's continued improvement from what's being done with gas. So um, it's a matter of one isn't sitting still to wait for the other to pass it or to reach it or to, to achieve those things. So, so that also is another dynamic. It isn't as if, you know, they're both fluid. They're, they're both not staying at the same place, which, which makes catching up of one, of one alternative to beat the incumbent or to beat the one that, that you know, industry and, and economies are built on. Um, not until one really stops improving will I think the other have a chance at, at, a, at a greater degree or at a quicker degree overtake it and become you know, the choice of tomorrow. So, uh, but, but that's, it's, it's all very interesting right now to watch and I think um, it's very healthy in the fact that both are, you know, both continue to move towards improvements and I think, I, I, I don't know what 2030 will look like. Um, I worry about, you know, making everybody, <laughs> that all our vehicles have, have, are running as they should right now as our industry is built on time. Uh, and if, when somebody can put more hours in a day, uh, or you know, handle something like that, I, I, I think we'd invest in that immediately. But um, you know, short of that, I, I, it's, a, it's a matter of sitting back and, and as a consumer enjoying, um, enjoying those advancements and trying to take advantage of them as we can. You see, working at the commission, there's always we're always looking ahead. It's never. No, they're it's always. Ne busy. They're, they're, they're never. They're, 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 they're never living for today. It's always right. 2020. 2030. <laughs> Uh, yes. I'm Carla Cotone, I work for Goodyear Dunlop Tires. Um, I have noticed that we have not mentioned the word tires today, and I know that since I've joined the company, um, every day, I think not one day, I have not heard the word fuel efficient tires. So I was wondering what is the view of the panel about this topic? Uh, which way? <laughs> Go on. Um, tires, I, 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 I talked about, as far as I remember, about tire pressure. But on top of it, fuel efficient tires are very important. Uh, there's a lot of energy being lost in the tires. It, it comes as warmth, as, as the tires get warm. And there are uh, opportunities in designing better and more fuel efficient tires. We are in constant uh, uh, close cooperation with our tire suppliers in order to figure out, is there more to be had? This is very complicated because tires is not only about fuel efficiency, it's about loading, how much load they can carry, it's about wear, and it's about braking also, so, so you should not, they have longer braking distances because you have a fuel efficient tire, and it's also about wet, so you, these trucks are constantly take water when it drains out there. So there's many things that you have to balance when you design a tire, we have great partners out there, um, many, many good suppliers. We work diligently, like everywhere in the truck, to get those uh, parasitic losses down. And when you've got a, a huge fleet like yours, Cindy, do, do tires really make it make a, a difference? I mean, do you measure what difference it can make in terms of fuel? I'll give you an example. Um, it was mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, Dr. Bernard had talked about telematics. And what does telematics do and what can telematics tell you? And telematics, from our perspective, we use it um, throughout the U.S. and um, looking to use it more widely throughout Europe. And, but that's yet another issue that I'll mention in a minute. But as an example, uh, one of the key things, the key components of some of the things that we use from the engineering-based portion of what telematics can tell us about a vehicle as it's rolling, as it's engaged in its, its daily usage, um, where, where we are with tire pressure, you know, how the tires are wearing, what's going on, telematics uh, with, the, with the independent sensors that we have on our vehicles, let us know ahead of time. Uh, you know, when tires aren't performing as they should, when they need to be replaced, as opposed to the old-fashioned way. Uh, at UPS, what we used to do was we would have a preventative maintenance inspection schedule. So the fleet of, um, you know, X amount of vehicles on any given day are being reviewed and being checked periodically. But how good is it to have a system like telematics tell you ahead of time, rather than wait until a scheduled October 15th review of 10 vehicles, that you have two out of those 10 that tomorrow aren't running, they're not running as efficiently as they should be today, based on tires, based on batteries, based on, on uh, filters, based on any of the things that telematics can tell us, so that we can proactively get ahead of it. All of those things, with, with, uh, with millions of, of uh, kilometers driven a day, 
um, make that much of a greater difference. So tires come into uh, very, they're very, very important. Uh, okay, is there any way of measuring, uh, you know, and how much it could mean in terms of fuel efficiency? Uh, actually, I, I, we, in, in the telematics, I, I don't have a, that particular statistic uh, off the top of my head. Wrong tire but, pressure. But I do know. Wrong tire pressure. Sorry, in, in the truck can cause two to five percent increase in fuel efficiency. Right. Okay. Two to five percent, just yeah. with the wrong pressure. Yeah. But you were talking about telematics, actually, yes. I mean, no, that's something that's very developed in the States, but yes. not so developed in Europe. Well, actually, um, the, it's not necessarily the developed part of it. It is it, developed. No, it's, yeah, no, whether, no, or it's it's, it's, whether or not it's allowed to be yeah. used. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we find maybe barriers to, to continued efficiencies, and a few other things, is the fact that um, telematics is is available in some places, other places won't allow it, um, and yet, uh, it, you know, overall, I think it's key, and it's one of the key things for us to continue to be to, to maintain a proactive approach to, to to putting vehicles on the road every day to make sure that they are running as efficiently as they possibly can. And, and it's data protection issues, is it? In Europe? It is data protection issues. As an example, um, and. Someone had mentioned um, had mentioned accidents or had mentioned uh, security. Um, we would have the capability in the U.S. to know whether or not the driver has a seatbelt on. Of course, we would all assume that every every person in a vehicle would wear their seatbelts. Yet, the ability to know whether or not a driver is wearing a seatbelt here is a is is an issue of contention uh, for some of the various works councils over the fact that that's taking taking the ability to know what's going on in a car a little bit too far. Um, it depends on you know what side of the coin you are um, as to what position you would like to argue. But but those particular types of issues um, are what I think holds us back. We we would know idle time, excessive idle time of vehicles uh, in the road, vehicles that are left on that shouldn't be left on, vehicles that you know there's an awful lot of things that go with it um, that you, I think we'd have to weigh the upside of of, um, of the goodness that it can provide versus the, the proposed in, in, in infringements from um, a personal data um, protection type uh, situation. I'm, I'm not here to say which one's right or wrong, but I am here to say that as we're talking about efficiency, that's a huge tool and, and uh, an opportunity that I think bears, to, bears more vetting as far as whether or not it's... it's do do it's you have, have a view on that in DG Move? Because it quite clearly could, could actually have a big impact. Yes, I mean, I like very much the way the discussion is developing. Because we start to find the 2% uh, service potential here and the 3% there and 5% again in another area. I think that is, in the, in the political system, we always have the temptation to look for the one magical solution. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, realistically, to work towards the future optimization was the word that, uh, that Mr. Del, Be Del Becker was using, optimized European road transportation system. It, we have to have the patience to get our hands on the compound effect of all these incremental improvements that can be done across the board. And that is what will deliver us the more uh, environmentally efficient transportation system, of which the truck itself is one important element, but not the only one. The way the market works, uh, the way the uh, uses, usage of infrastructure is, uh, is financed, uh, the, the, how the resources for the maintenance of the infrastructure is secured because of the, the impact that, again, the state of the infrastructure has on fuel consumption. The, the tires discussion, I have no knowledge on the matter, and the, that falls on the, on the remit of another department of the Commission, but I think it belongs absolutely to, to this but discussion. Does it not make you think, though, when you hear about all these things, which are, as you say, are incremental, but together they make a, a big hole, but doesn't it just show that, that the, the fuel efficiency is being very much market driven, you know, we're seeing it from UPS. So do you actually, you know, why what, do we need much in the way of legislation when it seems to be happening? It is happening and yet it could be happening even more. And the, the benefits that I think society is entitled to 
can be reaped by some legislative uh, modernization and updating. And that is what we are doing with the Weights and Dimensions uh, Directive. It gives an additional possibility. The developments are happening in any case that is market driven. Yeah. And we think that the present legislative framework puts an unwarranted obstacle on it. It is happening, but it could happen to a greater extent. Right. And that is what we want to do. I think, uh, I think too, I, just as I don't think business is the bad guy in the room, I certainly don't think that policy or you know legislation is either. Um, because I, I will share this with you, whether we're looking at um, driver regulations, or we're looking at trainings, or we're looking at standards, or we're looking at several other things, with, without the enforcement, from, a, from without, without the guidelines, without the policy, without the legislation, um, you, we end up with, um, you know, companies and businesses that comply and, and uphold, you know, their level of so social responsibility, fiduciary responsibility to shareholders, employer responsibilities to employees, and, and they do them to a level that I believe a lot of positiveness comes from, from legislation. But I also know that 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 um, enforcement and and really kind of um, kind of upholding that which the groundwork that's already been laid is also a very critical very critical point and, and that's across every industry and it's but, but certainly in our industry as well because um, we all know um, you know companies that 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 may not have as high standards yeah um, and yet you know, continue to do some of the things that undermine all of the goodness that, that many other companies are trying to do. So I agree that there's a place. And let me just take this question. Uh, I can't, sorry, I can't you, please. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is William Tosh from Transport and Environment. I have one short question for um, Dr. Bernhardt. It's a question of clarification, really. Um, you said the cap changes, they are enabling, and so, so it's just a matter of flexibility for manufacturers. Do I understand it correctly that as long as it's just enabling you, you're not opposed to this? Because I, I had seen the position paper of ASEA and I had, written, I had seen that you were asking for a 15 year uh, moratorium or lead time. And then a, a second question for all the panelists, uh, maybe for Ms. Miller in particular. The, the big question is how we accelerate progress because uh, on CO2 we've had progress 30% over 40 years, but most of that progress was before 1990 as we have seen uh, earlier on. Um, so the question is really, will increased transparency be enough and should we not, like Ms. Edgar uh, mentioned earlier, also look at standards? Uh, UPS obviously has uh, experience with that in the US and I was wondering how you, uh, how you felt that that was going. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Um, <clears throat> once again, um, uh, I don't want to sound like a, a broken record. But uh, again, in terms of priorities, uh, clearly we, we, we emphasize that um, freedom to do changes at the rear are the ones where we get the most bang for the buck. Um, bigger changes in the front, we're just studying and analyzing what the implications are. It might might need changes in the certification and type certification of the vehicles, which are might, might be very complicated, so we have to get together with the Commission through this whole exercise and understanding what we're asking for here. This is the process that we have to go through. And I'm just saying, I don't want to hold up everything by the front while we can do things in the rear. We're holding up in the front, so let's go for the rear and get it, right? So, and we'll work, continue to work on the front and get this going. We will be willing to be there and together, this is exactly what we want to do in the ASEA. So again, um, things are a little bit more complicated, and um, and again, let's not waste any time. And um, th thank you for the question. The the response, if I can just make sure that I, I got it, is how do we accelerate accelerate all of these efficiencies, uh, and what's needed or what's missing? Um, one of the things that I would say is the common glue between many of the things that we had talked about. Um, whether the issue is road charging and the fact that there's 28 different member states with a different vision of what road charging should be, where the funds go. Um, that's something that's doable today from an infrastructure a structure investment that needs you know, further push from the folks that want every, everything else accelerated. 
um, whether we take a look at um, telematics, and, and it's something that we have today that can help improve, but we need more of a unified voice in our ability to be able to de deploy it everywhere and, and get its full benefits of it. You can take a look at alternative fuels. Um, you can take a look at uh, everything from, from um, just overall market harmonization. You can take a look at um, city access. Uh, right now, uh, just, to, just to paint the picture from a city access, access perspective, 16.1 million packages are, are going to be transported by, well, today, it's December, and with it coming to the holidays, we'll get to the point where on peak day, 34 million pieces will be moving in the UPS system in one day. All of those things come into different points, they land in Europe every day, and in order to go into a city, UPS takes millions of those packages and defines them and fills a vehicle. So we consolidate already millions of things that have gone on around the world. We'll consolidate them and we'll make sure at UPS, the other thing I'd like to say is a full package car is a happy package car. Uh, just the thought is, if it goes into a city center, it should go in full, which means it's already been consolidated and, it's a, and, and it can be used as efficiently as possible. Then, then what we want to do is make sure we pick pick up enough stuff to fill it up to bring it back out. So when we talk about any of those issues, uh, a lot of cities, and a, a, a many, are coming up with their own design and their own rules and regulations on, on how to make a city more efficient. And yet, there are companies that in order, that that's what we do every day, that's our bailiwick, that's, that's our sweet spot. Um, so there are plenty of things to improve efficiencies now that I think a more unified EU voice uh, um, uh, will be, it is, as much as it wants to be part of the solution, at some points in time, all of the individuality perspectives of many of the member states is also um, maybe one of the biggest hurdles we've got to get over. Thank you for the question. Yes, it was the question <clears throat> where the standards are on the table. I think um, on our table, all options are on the table. Um, today, it's sad that the high fuel costs have been helping us a lot, has helped driving the industry towards very fuel efficient trucks. But it's sad at the same time because we pay up these invoices up to 3% of our GDP every year, year after year. So it's a question that bothers us. Can we continue like that? So, so far it has helped us. Uh, but there may be a point that we will have to consider additional options. So standards are something we are looking at, but first we have to know better and we have to have more comparability of efforts, fuels, emissions, etc. Um, I picked the point by Cindy Miller, I think, on, 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 on the road charging. That also should be an option we have to look at and we have to have a very open view what to do with the revenues. Um, if it optimizes infrastructure, why should we not do that? Um, I, I think we have made a first step in Europe, but uh, we cannot have 28 systems. We, can, we cannot continue in with the variety we have, and we cannot have a, a system that in the end may not matter that much, because the traffic jams are still there. Uh, the fuels that we are consuming are still there. So we have to have a fresh look, as I said, to the cluster of things, but road charging could also be part of the equation, how to optimize what we have and how to create a truly internal market and how to compare with other uh, transport modes and optimize our overall system. Because after all, we've said uh, um, Europe is a densely populated area. That also applies to more infrastructure. You know, we have to start using the available infrastructure in a much more efficient manner. And I think that that is where a, a, a pragmatic tool like road charging could help us. I'm not making here a plea for road charging, don't misinterpret me. I'm saying all options are on the table, including standards, including road charging, including other elements like certification and market barriers that we have to remove. Yeah, somebody here says, what can be done about road service as well as tyres to increase the fuel efficiency of trucks? I mean, it's, it is a big issue. But when, when, you, when you talk about standards, I mean, we're talking about Europe, but you know, there are already standards in the US and China and Japan or whatever. I mean, what about the, the globalisation? Because I presume that from a manufacturer's point of view, that is a, an issue. 
yes, we are uh, very much aware of that. And, and we see that other parts of the world are setting standards. We in Europe, we do not set standards. But we are aware of what is happening in the, in the United States. We are aware about what is China uh, is planning. And so we, we, we are really having that question in the back of our mind. But when we look at cars, the standards we developed for cars gradually developed into standards that were followed by the world at large. So, in fact, we have there a very good story. We were good at developing the technologies, at pinching the targets that were deliverable. Industry was very good in reaching them. We are ahead of the world, and I think the image of our brands in the world is top. They are the best all over. And when I look at what is happening, for example, in China, they are following the standards. They are only one or two standards behind us, given the, 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 the difference in, in economic development. I think they take us as the reference point. And uh, perhaps on, on Loris, we have to have a fresh look at whether we can perhaps also not do something that is recognizing the leadership we have and at least through certification and monitoring, we could better trumpet how good we are, and perhaps on the basis of that, win uh, world markets or global markets. May I add a little bit to it? Uh, first of all, it's correct that uh, we are paving the way for the world. Mm -hmm. Our standards are paving the way for the world. We have, uh, when you look at Brazil, South America, if you look at China, what are the standards they adopt? Emission standards they adopt are European standards. So Brazil is moving from Euro 4 to Euro 5, thinking about moving to Euro 6. If you look at China, they are in Euro 4, think about Euro, Euro 5. So, so everybody is basically embrace, embracing emission standards that, 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 uh, that we put out. Two differences there are America and, um, China and Japan, they have their own standards. And again, for us, it would be very, very uh, uh, desirable to harmonize those, or at least have a mutual recognition of those standards. So with the um, IITB discussions going on with the United States and Europe, we just encourage, you know, if we could, I mean, harmonizing is not, is, forget it, it's not going to happen anytime soon, because everybody has to uh, put their uh, regulatory egos into the dock, you know, nobody's not going to happen. So just make sure that we, we acknowledge each other's standards, it's fairly close, and it's fair enough, I mean, if we're not, if we look at e 10 it's not, it's fairly close what we have, we should be as open and say, let's, let's recognize it, and when we move to next emission or whatever standard, then make sure that we harmonize it, otherwise we lose too much time. Again, we're paving, paving the way in terms of standards. It applies for passenger cars. It applies for it applies for trucks as well. And and we're working on uh, to to figure out the transparency uh, on on fuel efficiency and the CO2. And it could be another blueprint for the world. Christian, you wanted to come. Yeah, just a quick, quick one still to come back to the issue on, on the lead times so or moratoriums, and then maybe the issue that uh, Ms. Yeah. Miller opened up on road charging, but on the lead times and a moratoria, it's one thing when the legislator tells the industry that you must do something, and the issue of, of uh, moratoriums on lead, lead times uh, seems quite uh, reasonable. When the legislator tells industry that you can do something, not that you must do, you can do, there's an opportunity for you if you believe that there are takers in the market for that. The notion that there should be a moratorium or a lead time for that is not as, uh, as evident. It is another matter that as an industrial project, designing, conceiving a new concept for the for, for, for cab or a truck will take time. It's a big industrial exercise. But, uh, but I think this is something that we will discuss with the, with the, with the industry and the, and the stakeholders. Pro charging since the issue was put on the table. It's of course a very live issue in very many member states at the moment, not least in Germany, in the context of the of recent elections. Because every member state is faced with the same challenges, where to secure the financing, not so much to build new transport infrastructure, but to ensure the maintenance, to keep the, the, the existing, the legacy infrastructure in good shape. But similarly, 
the optimization of the, of the usage of that infrastructure. The fact that the answer cannot be always building new lanes. Part of the answer must be that you make better, more efficient use of the existing lanes. And since we have today in Europe any number of, uh, of uh, different road charging uh, systems, it is obvious that the Commission is also closely looking into this matter. There are no decisions to be announced, there are no, no final uh, uh, initiatives at this stage, but the question comes up at some stage whether to bring some, to bring the different developments at national level within some more coherent frame, whether the, 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 the time for a European uh, level initiative is, uh, is, is coming, I think that's something that the next Commission will, will, will certainly want to look into. <laughs> the next Commission is going to have a lot on its hands. <laughs> but it, I mean, it is a problem, isn't it? The next year, it's sort of this strange limbo land, isn't it, where everyone's saying, well, that will wait for the next Commission, and, you know, it must be quite frustrating, I think, as policy makers. Somebody, uh, sorry, we've got another question there, about the yeah. So I can't see very well at the back because it's a That's, that, that's okay, I'm, I'm, I'm up here. I, I actually promised myself I wouldn't say too much today. It's Michael Nielsen from the IIU. Uh, but the bang for the box actually woke me up uh, quite dramatically because how will we get most bang for the box here? Well, by transporting more with less is how we will get most bang for the box. Not necessarily by putting a tail tailpipe on a, a, a semi-trailer, but putting some extra pallets and being allowed to put some extra pallets into the semi-trailers. That would give bang for the box immediately. That said, however, I do believe that we need to look at everything. We need to be allowed to innovate. That's exactly what Christian is saying here. The Commission, with their proposal, allow us to innovate further. It allows us to innovate on the trailers. It allows us to innovate on the tractors. I'm slightly disappointed to hear, and I don't think I hear this, that, that, that the manufacturers are trying to push things to the back and say maybe work there instead of work in the front. I think we should work everywhere. I think we need to work as well with the drivers. We need to do eco training, eco driving training as well. We need to work with the tire manufacturers. We need to work with the infrastructure guys. We need to work with the telematics guys in order to optimize everything. And we cannot just, you know, put the monkey around from different shoulders. I mean, that would not help us as the operators and to drive down our costs because that's what we're interested in. So allow the sector to innovate. Road pricing was mentioned in the end here. Yes, road pricing is nice, but only if the money is earmarked. Earmarked to innovation, earmarked to infrastructure. Otherwise, it's just going into the big black hole of, uh, of tax revenues. And that, of course, is something that we see as, as crucial uh, as well. If we do not have earmarking on road charging, then we cannot innovate further. One just last uh, thing I have on, on, uh, on uh, innovation is basically that if, if we're not, if we have legislation that restricts us to innovate, or we have manufacturers that are re resisting new legislation that allows us to innovate, we will probably end up, and I'm not saying that the vehicles we don't see outside is innovative, because they are the most innovative that you can get today, but we will end up with having tractors that are looking exactly the same, which is what we have today. But maybe tomorrow we would see vehicle combinations that are looking totally different and we, the operators, we would buy those vehicle uh, combinations that is the most efficient vehicle combinations. Thank you. Not to say Dr. Bernard. Okay. Nice summary of the gentleman. That's not uh, too much to say. Mm -hmm. Very much in agreement with everything you said and we're not okay. saying anything much fine, different. Fine. Um, just in there. Somebody here is saying, uh, well, if I, yes, I've lost it now. Well, yes, will DG Climate have more impact on road transport than DG Move from 2014 onwards? Well, first... It's not uh, that I'm trying to, to, to put a, something between you, you know. You know, no, there is no... There is, there is no, uh, it's a good attempt to, yeah. to put something between us, but we work together in the Commission. But you, you made a side comment, uh, it must be frustrating uh, for uh, policy makers to sit on our hands for another year. Well, I can reassure you, we are not sitting on our hands. And uh, we are preparing our policies together with the stakeholders, as you all, most of you know. Uh, we may sum up that strategy and make prepare the ground for future decisions to be made. So policy making is a process 
also, it's not just an end point, it's a process. Because uh, before you go into a proposal as a commission, a proposal for a directive, you have two, three, four years of preparatory work at least yeah. before you, and then you need another three, five years to bring it through co-decision in Council and Parliament. So that means uh, you have to do your homework very well, otherwise you miss the opportunity of the next commission. And I think that is how legislation is being made, and the, the value is in good preparation. If you have no good preparation, then you miss the point, or you badly legislate them. We are not in for that. Uh, we're sort of coming to, well, let me take one more question, then we'll sort of do a bit of a wrap up. So, yes, gentlemen here, if we have a microphone. One of the questions that I'm, I'm going to ask, which was actually um, a Twitter question, was just what, pe what people think that the track of the future will look like. I'll just leave that with you to think about while we take this question. Yes, Simon Godwin from the U European Council for Automotive R&D. So we represent the automotive manufacturers in the collaborative research activities. So uh, innovative is uh, one of the important statements that, that we're making here. Now, manufacturers, uh, automotive manufacturers invest over 32 million per year. A big chunk of that uh, comes from the truck manufacturers, so that's where a lot of the innovation comes from. But when we're talking about societal challenges, the challenge for fuel efficiency, for CO2 emissions, for safety, uh, then it's very important also to have the publicly funded research. And in the European context, we're talking about the framework programs. The next framework program, Horizon 2020, just ratified this week, in fact, and it's going to be starting in, in January. Uh, during the negotiations, we had to fight tooth and nail to maintain the, the share of that program that goes towards the transport. We didn't quite manage that, but uh, we, we nearly did. Uh, and now that we see it being implemented, uh, we see a pretty decent chunk coming towards uh, our section of the industry. But if you look at the European Green Vehicle Initiative, which is the successor to the current European Green Cars Initiative, its budget is more or less the same per year over the seven years of Horizon 2020. So it's not an increase, we an increase. And if you look at the, the other part, which is road transport, which looks at safety, vehicle safety, which looks at uh, conventional vehicles and things, um, then the budget for that is more or less what it was uh, under the seventh framework program, maybe even a, bit, a little bit less. So on one side, we've got all these great uh, demands, challenges for our industry, societal challenges, industrial challenges. But on the other side, we've got a, a framework program which is not really um, providing the, uh, uh, the necessary push uh, for the collaborative innovation, which is extremely important for, uh, for leveraging. Now, uh, uh, Commissioner Hedegaard actually came to our annual conference last year, and she was very supportive of uh, this, but I'd just like to, to ask the uh, two gentlemen from the Commission, and anybody else in the, uh, in the room who has a voice, if you'll continue to push for um, our section of the, uh, uh, of the transport sector to, to get uh, a, let's say, a significant and sufficient share of Horizon 2020 budget targeted at the important uh, challenges so that we can really meet those challenges. Yes. Um, well, I, I just wanted to, uh, to draw your attention the MFF, the Multi-Annual Financial Framework that was adopted, that there is a strong legal commitment that 20% of the entire MFF, of the entire European budget, will be related to climate change in a direct or indirect way. And for some of the programs, Horizon 2020, the research program, that percentage is 35%. So I think that's a quite significant uh, figure. That's why I'm rather confident you can, you can count on us that we are going to push the program. I do not know the details of the program that you are ma managing, but 35% of the entire research budget of 70 billion is quite something with which we can and we should be able to leverage funds in your area as in other areas. I think that's exactly the, the way we see it and our colleagues in the research department see it as well. That's covered up, yeah, okay. Well, uh, we are sort of coming to an end, but um, I just, just very quickly, just a couple of you, maybe you, Cindy, what would you say that the, 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 the track of you is going to look like? Or I mean, what, you know, is it going to be driverless or is it going to be, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know what it's going to look like, um, and I won't, I won't take this time uh, selfishly to, for, for any other type of uh, reiteration of what we've said, but I would leave what it's going to look like to the experts. Uh, just know that we will be probably a very big consumer and very interested 
in what's going to be the most efficient for us to be able to uh, to do what we do for the consumer, both the shipper and the consignee, in the most efficient manner possible. So I, it's got to be ultra efficient, and we will remain as a consumer constructively dissatisfied. <laughs> the wheel has come full circle. What's your, what's your view on? on, on First of all, I, I thought uh, that uh, we spent a very fruitful afternoon. It was uh, very good to hear from the commissioner uh, what's going on, what your thoughts are. Uh, I thought, I also think that it's very important that uh, we together come together and argue and discuss what needs to be done. Uh, we also doing this in public to make sure that everybody understands that we are really struggling here. And this is not about easy answers and one silver bullet, but a lot of levers that we need to push in order to uh, push the needle in the right direction. I think um, we all conveyed, hopefully, that message that the industry, the customers, and the regulators basically are not uh, uh, disconnected, but very much connected and, and work jointly and constructively and open to that end. And um, we've come a long way, and I'm sure that uh, in the future, uh, with this kind of work, we will be able to accomplish great things. That's my okay. And, and Josh but can I just ask you, I mean, when you come to an event like this, do you, do you hear things that you haven't heard before? I mean, do you, do, does it open, open your mind a little bit to some of the issues? Yes, it does. Um... You didn't dare say no. <laughs> No, of course we, we work very closely with the stakeholders and my colleagues are in a, in a standards and a, and, a, and a deep debate with the stakeholders and ASEAN yeah, is, a, is a very well-known organization with whom we work very intensively. Of course, my, my personal attention shifts from one policy file to the other. We just have the cars behind us and, then, and now we are in other files. So, uh, yes, and I, what I find interesting is the different accents that are given to a multitude of things that are landing on our table, lots of uh, studies and whatever, okay, you, you deepen the argument here through the exchange of uh, ideas we had. And so what we have to work on, and, and, and we have no choice, and I think that uh, Connie Hedegaard was very clear into that, we need a low carbon transport system in Europe because we cannot continue having one sector increasing emissions while the others are decreasing emissions, knowing that we have to go to minus 80% at least in 2050. So it's unavoidable. And then our options and our uh, analysis is open. And I, I'm sure that the truck of the future will find its place. But it's very difficult as of now to prescribe exactly what that place is going to be. But I, for me, it's un, without any doubt. The truck has many other uh, qualifications beyond what we have been discussing here. And so in the mix of things, I have no doubt that uh, with good technology and with push technology on which we can also keep our world leadership. I think that is perhaps one of the most rewarding things as a regulator. That is that we are being followed by other parts of the world. I yeah. think that's very rewarding because Europe is 500 million inhabitants, but we are with 7 billion on the world today. We are moving to 9, 10 billion, and the part of Europe is shrinking. So we can maintain our place in doing our work well as a regulator and as a business, also doing that part of the job well, and with good cooperation, we can get there. And just a word from DG Move. Well, I would be absolutely horrified uh, to hear an official like myself suggest that we have any intelligence on what the, what the future truck might look like. That is really, <laughs> really, really for the for the hosts of uh, of this event who have uh, kindly kindly invited us here. No, I just want to see the where we started from, the, the greener, safer, smarter truck on the roads as uh, soon as possible for the benefit of of, uh, of European society. Thank you very much indeed. Sophie, do you have any, anything to add? No, I just thought, thought you were going for the microphone. <laughs> The only thing I was going to say that I think is something that we, we continue to forget. When I started with UPS, we may have handled uh, probably uh, maybe seven, six or seven million packages a day. We're up to 16 million packages a day handling them. And I will tell you this, 
One of the interesting dynamics, because we keep hearing about, about this particular sector and the amount of CO2 that continues to climb, uh, respectively, uh, I would imagine if I asked for a show of hands of everybody who has ordered something online and expected that particular package to come to your home, if you think about the fact that, that if, if that product that you wanted was going into a distribution site or a or a Cora or one of the local stores, there would be a hundreds, hundreds of packages going to one place, which is pretty efficient. Now, if you turn around and none of you want to go there, um, but you expect someone to bring it to you to your home, then obviously as, as home consumers and as, as the consumer gets more decision power on where they want it, when they want it, how they want it, what time they want it, um, there will be almost an exponential rise just in the fact that there's more stuff being delivered, there's, there's more consumerism, and I think that has to come into play as we think about things. It's not purely that this industry has not thought about those things, but you also can't regulate the consumer as to when they want it, or where they want it, or how many of them they want. Uh, so those single parcels, those single, just to my house, my iPhone, um, that becomes an issue, whereas we could take thousands of them to one re re retail place. So um, just as I hear those things where things continue to exponentially climb, it, it isn't by happenstance. It's, um, it's by what the market has changed into requiring, and I hope that comes into play in some of the things that we think about. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much indeed for your discussions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all the questions, but I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. Thank you all very much and for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists for their interesting interventions. I don't know whether you, uh, you felt it as well. There are quite some positive vibes in the room this afternoon. I'm not sure whether that is because we're getting close to Christmas. Uh, but we definitely hope, as I say, that these positive vibes will continue vibrating outside this room in the coming weeks and months as we uh, continue engaging with the institutions uh, on some of the, the policy and legislative proposals which were, we were covering today, weights and dimensions, CO2, just to quote a few. Uh, difficult to kind of come to real conclusions here, but just a few, a few messages I took out of this afternoon's discussion, which was very rich in terms of content. First of all, we, we heard there are no one-stop magical solutions, right? So we, we got to have, as an industry, to continue working together with the different players involved in transport, and that's other parts of the industry, but also policymakers and other stakeholders, to find solutions. And we're going to have to find the solutions in different areas. There's not one fit all solution here when we want to come up with the track of the future, the safest, the most fuel efficient one. We should keep in mind at the end of the day, and that was really uh, well articulated in the panel discussion, that trucks continue to play a major role in ensuring that goods are moving around in Europe. I mean, you all heard the slogan, you bought it, the trucks brought it. And, and, and that remains the case today and will continue to be the case in the future. Means that trucks and transportation continue really a backbone for the economy of Europe, an engine for growth. And whatever we do affecting trucks, whatever we do affecting the transport sector, we need to keep that in mind. Because at the end of the day, I mean, we were talking about the globe. Uh, the economic situation in Europe is for the time being not that rosy. So we should move cautiously and make sure that we keep our priorities right. We need to get and fix this economy first. That's why we as an industry have been also very vocal 
on saying that whatever new policy legislation comes our way, let's make sure we do a thorough impact assessment. Let's make sure we are choiceful. Let's make sure we take into account what impact new proposals will have on the competitiveness of our industry. And by the way, if you've seen the logos of all our member companies, these companies are not just European companies, they are global players. Their marketplace is the globe, and we want to keep these companies competitive, not only in Europe, but globally. We heard trucks have become more fuel efficient. Yes, more can be done and will be done. Uh, it will, of course, be important to ensure we can gradually also move the fleet we have today to some of these new models and this new technology. I mean, a lot of the targets which are being set apply to the new vehicles we bring to the market. And so we need to find ways and incentives over time to see how we can also look at the existing fleet. Trucks have incorporated innovation to improve safety. The video was very clear. And there's a, a lot of commitment within our industry to do even more in this area. Technology helps big time. And there's a lot which is being invested in that area. You also heard our manufacturers want to play ball with other stakeholders continue working with the institutions and we thank the Commission for being present here today, we thank the European Parliament for having been represented today. We're, not, we're going to continue working closely together with these institutions. It's only in dialogue that we're going to be able to move forward to address the transport challenges of, of tomorrow. And then last but not least, I think you know we need to keep in mind that as we are moving forward, as we are moving forward to develop this track of the future, that we should keep economy and ecology in balance. At the end of the day, as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that this economy in Europe keeps growing and at least our sector wants to contribute big time to that growth. I want to conclude here. Thank again all our speakers for their uh, remarkable interventions. Uh, thank you to our moderator who has done a splendid job in bridging, in bringing everybody together. Thanks to you for your questions and your participation. I wish you a very good evening and I invite you to continue the discussion over a glass of wine in the room next to us. Thank you and see you next time.